Are we live? Okay. Uh, hello to everybody out there in the cyber world. Um, welcome to the Consumer and Governmental um, Bureau's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs first webinar with our state and local groups as well as their members. Uh, I'd like to thank our Bureau Chief Joel Gurin for making this possible. And we just want to remind you that you can view the um, the webcast can be viewed at fcc.gov forward slash live, and you can email questions in to livequestions at fcc.gov uh, at any time during the webinar. <coughs> and um, some of the groups that we know that are out there participating today are uh, NAG, National Association of Attorneys Generals, NACO, National Association of Counties, NA um, NATO, National Association of Development Organizations, NARUC, our friends over there at National Association of Regulatory Care, uh, Commissioners, NATOA, NCSL, NGA, NLC, U.S. Conference of Mayors, NACIO, um, CSG, NDCSL, NHCSL, NCBM, and uh, Nasuka. So sorry for the abbreviations, but we're running a little behind, and I think um, all of our uh, state and local participants uh, know our, uh, know these groups well. Uh, I think we have some folks on the as well on the uh, dial-in line. So if you can identify yourself and your organization, that would be great. Hello. This is Dave Bergman from the Ohio Consumers Council and Nasuka. Great. Thanks, Dave. And Earl Poucher from the Office of Public Counsel in Florida. Great. Anybody else? Went on a single Terry with the National Conference of Black Mayors. Thank you. James Ward with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Okay. Mike Smith with the Council of State Governments. Great. Ajane Clemens with the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Super. Jack McFadden, State of Tennessee, and uh, NASTD. Okay. I know, and I also know uh, people are also uh, watching the webinar live, so not everybody's dialing in, um, and I don't know if you, if you folks are also watching the live stream. Uh, so um, uh, I guess without further ado, let's uh, kick it off, and our first uh, presentation uh, is going to be on the National Broadband Plan, and we are extremely lucky to have Eric Garr, General, Manage uh, uh, General Manager of the Omnibus Broadband Initiative, and Tom Brown, the business associate on that, that team, to give the presentation. And uh, these guys have worked really, really, really hard over the last year, as you know. So uh, um, they're going to highlight the parts of the uh, broadband plan that are uh, they think are most important to you guys, our state and local governments. So, yeah, thanks, Greg, uh, and thanks everyone for joining. It, we'd like to do a couple of things with the time that we have with you today. Uh, first and foremost, I'll give a short overview of the plan, um, try to put it in some context, uh, go through the basic argument of the plan, uh, which really goes through three parts. Tom will highlight a few telecommunications specific issues and then I'll close with some of the national purpose issues that, that may be of interest to, to all of you. And we won't go through everything because it's a 367-page plan and we have, you know, 15 minutes. So we're going to pick uh, the issues that we think will be most relevant to, uh, to all of you. So with that, um, I think it's important to pause before you get into the plan and really consider the historical context in which it sits. Um, this is not the first time that our nation has had a new infrastructure that we want to connect everyone to. And just about, you know, every once in a while something comes up, whether it's railroads or electricity or interstate highways, where the country and private industry really need to work together uh, to try and bring a particular technology to the whole country. Uh, when it's a country as big, diverse, and uh, complicated as ours, it's, it's tricky and it takes some time to solve these problems. Um, it's important, I think, to first look at rural electrification as a great model. I think when we look through all the different uh, historical examples as part of the research for the plan, rural electrification was the one that came up often. Um, you know, in the turn of the, at the turn of the last century, uh, electricity was a great thing. And if you lived in a 
uh, relatively wealthy area with a relatively dense population, it was pretty likely that someone would sell you electricity service. And you could purchase that service and light your house and do whatever you needed to do. And if you were a business, you probably had uh, a power facility on your premises. So, you know, it was very normal for every factory to have a power plant uh, that would create electricity to be used in different manufacturing processes. And over time, the great companies of the, of the day, like General Electric and Westinghouse, continued to evolve that infrastructure to the point where, you know, in most major cities, you had access to this, uh, this, this incredible platform. The problem was when you get to the 1930s, uh, it wasn't everywhere. Uh, and there were large parts of the country where there really wasn't a business case for electrification. Uh, many of them were rural areas uh, where the, the companies just had not brought the infrastructure because there were too few customers or the cost of uh, deploying the infrastructure was so great. Um, in the 30s, the government created the Rural Electrification Administration, which uh, is often remembered for the cooperatives, uh, the electric cooperatives that were part of it that were an incredible success story and, and, and something that I think is uh, a great example of industry, community, and government working together. But they also did a lot of other things that are sort of ironic when you look at the problems that, that we face today in broadband. Um, they actually focused a lot on adoption. Uh, there was, at the time in the 30s, and I'm, I'm from the Midwest and I can sort of imagine the discussions with local farmers uh, in some of the more rural areas of the country where a lot of farmers said, look, I don't need electricity. I've been running my farm the same way for a couple of generations. I don't really need this stuff. Um, and I think when you look at the totality of what the Rural Electrification Administration did, you recognize that any time you're trying to get all this infrastructure to the, the, the far reaches of the country, it's not just about deployment. Uh, it, it's certainly important to think about how do we get the infrastructure in place, but it's important to also think a lot about the other community issues and change issues that occur uh, when you're doing something on, on this scale. So that brings us to today, which is, you know, basically we have this nifty broadband infrastructure, and if you live in a relatively dense populated, wealthy part of this country, you probably have a choice of purchasing a couple different kinds of broadband. And over the, na over the last couple of years and, and into the next couple of years, you'll likely have a chance to buy even faster service. But that's clearly not the case all over the country. And that's really what the National Broadband Plan is about, and that's really what Congress asked us to do, which was to really lay out a plan so that we could get broadband access not just to the areas that have it today, um, although we should be conscious of those areas and make sure that there's competition and that uh, the network evolves in the places where it already exists, but that we should also pay close attention to places where we don't have the network. Uh, the plan lays out many goals uh, for the country that I think are aspirational and that should be monitored over the ne next several years to make sure that we uh, continue to improve this important infrastructure. Um, I won't go through each one in detail. Um, you can see them uh, in the slides that we have. You can also read them in the plan. Um, but I think it's important that we have a very high aspiration here. Um, we stayed away from international comparisons in the plan because they're fraught with methodological problems. Uh, comparing a country like the United States to a country like the Netherlands is really tricky. Uh, they're both lovely places. Uh, but whether they, you know, how to measure what broadband penetration should be in those places are so related to their own geographies, it's hard to do the comparisons. But the one thing that we should take from the plan is that we should not be complacent uh, and that for our economy to lead and our country to lead, we need to make sure that uh, we have fast infrastructure across the country that can help at the high end and that we also make sure that we're using public dollars appropriately to put infrastructure in places where we don't have it. Um, what I'd like to do is give everyone a quick overview of the fundamental argument of the plan. Uh, Tom's going to focus in on a couple of the areas that we think are most important to you and then we'll get on to questions. Uh, the plan is, it's basically a three-part plan and the reason for that is if you have a two-part plan that's not enough parts. And if you have more than three parts, it starts to get confusing. So we decided to stick with a three-part plan. Um, the first part is all about what's the appropriate government role in making sure that the broadband portion of the economy continues to innovate and continues to draw investment. Um, so that's a lot about competition policy. That's a lot about uh, rights of way and infrastructure, which Tom will talk a little bit about because that's a really important 
issue when you get to state and local. But the, the basic point here is this, in this country, a lot of this infrastructure, in fact, most of this infrastructure is owned and operated by private companies. And as such, the government has a role uh, in making sure that uh, that ecosystem is functioning properly and that those businesses can make the most of the $40 billion a year that they spend uh, to invest in those in our broadband networks. The second part of the plan is about inclusion, which is to say that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the good news is about broadband is that we have it in lots of places. The bad news is that there are places where it's missing. And as a country, it's important that we include everyone. Uh, the costs of exclusion go up every day. Uh, it's harder to find a job. It's harder to keep up with your homework. It's harder to get health care information every day that you don't have broadband. And those of us that have it are already starting to take it for granted. So the second part of the plan is, is all, all, all about what are the appropriate government investments to make sure that we include everybody, both from an infrastructure standpoint, making sure that the infrastructure actually exists in the appropriate places, as well as from an adoption standpoint, to make sure that those who want broadband uh, and who may not be able to get it through reasons such as cost, digital literacy, or relevance, uh, that the government tries to break down those barriers so that people have the choice uh, to use broadband. And then the, the last part of the plan is really about uh, how do we actually use this stuff. Uh, you know, I'm from the, spent all my career in technology, so I love to talk about networks and how nifty they are. But ultimately, it comes down to how do we use this, and how do we use this in education, in health care, uh, public safety, and, and other functions that, that the country requires. So that's the overview. What I'd like Tom to do is zero in on just a couple of key points, and then we'll wrap it up and get into questions um, he's going to zero in on infrastructure, universal service, and adoption, which I think are three areas of the plan that, that are extremely relevant to state and local governments. Um, Tom was one of our uh, aces on the team. He did an incredible job for us. Uh, he actually knows more about this plan than anybody, but I, I'm really glad to give him the opportunity to talk a little bit about his great work. So, Thanks very much, Eric. Um, again, as Eric indicated a little bit earlier in our discussion, when we were thinking about how to put together the broadband plan, we thought about, uh, from the telco perspective, how do we keep the cycle of innovation and investment continuing to work well? Uh, as you can see on this slide, that means a couple of things. That means lowering the cost of inputs like spectrum, like uh, the cost of operating poles, ducts, conduits, and rights of way, uh, so that broadband can be deployed more inexpensively. And then seeing how that leads to innovation in networks and devices and applications uh, that continues to bring all the things that we love about the Internet to Americans. So again, as Eric said, there's really three pieces of that puzzle that I wanted to focus on today uh, that should be of particular interest to state and local governments. The first one is infrastructure. Um, and this is kind of the unsexy part of the problem, uh, as we like to say, putting together the plan. Nobody really loves to talk about telephone poles. Nobody loves to talk about laying conduit underground that you can put uh, fiber into. But it becomes really important when you think about the cost of deploying uh, broadband infrastructure, especially out to rural areas. So the plan noticed that right now it's too costly. Uh, to access poles and other infrastructure in many cases, and that there's inefficient policies that affect deployment decisions. So uh, the make-ready process for preparing a telephone pole so that somebody who's supplying broadband can basically attach to that pole and provide broadband services. Um, resolving disputes between perhaps a pole owner and somebody trying to attach to the pole. Again, not terribly sexy stuff, but really important. Uh, it takes a long time to, act, to uh, resolve those types of access disputes, and we still have a lack of data on infrastructure today. Uh, in many cases, we don't know where uh, central offices are located. In many cases, we don't know where broadband infrastructure exists, uh, even if we wanted to build on that with our deployment efforts. So the plan takes action uh, and recommends a number of targeted uh, agenda items to make you know, our broadband infrastructure work better. First of all, uh, recommends that we lower the cost of access to utility-owned poles, ducts, conduits, and rights-of-way, uh, particularly with a focus on low, uniform rates. Right now, cable companies pay a rate that is different than uh, ILEX or local exchange carriers pay to attach to certain poles. Uh, and what that tend to does is distort the market uh, in favor of one type of attacher versus another type of attacher. So in the plan, we wanted to focus on making sure that that rate was low and uniform. If I could just add a little something to that, 
um, you're going to hear from a couple of other people's people during the course of the day. I think Marcus is going to come and talk about some of the proceedings that are going on here at the FCC on pole attachments, and Aaron is going to come and talk about tower siting. So the, the, there's a lot of details in here, and in particular, this is one where uh, it's important that we work together with local government on this. Uh, I know that we're in the process of getting ready to launch our local government task force where we want to kind of work collaboratively on these problems. Um, when I spend time with folks in state and local government, you know, everyone's a little sensitive around this part of the plan. And to be fair, some state and local entities do a great job of this, and there's kind of no issue. Uh, the problem is it's not necessarily the case everywhere, and that's why we need to work together to find a way to stretch that $40 billion of investment as, as far as it can. Couldn't agree more. Uh, and so we'll look forward to working with you, hearing input from you as the NPRM process rolls on. And again, you'll hear a lot more about that uh, from Marcus later in today's conversation. Uh, we also noticed uh, in gathering data around the plan that it's in many cases a lot less expensive to conduct joint trenching, a uh, situation where you lay fiber or you lay conduit at the same time that you're digging up a roadway anyway for infrastructure projects. So the plan makes specific recommendations about uh, joint trenching uh, and financing for those types of projects. On universal service, uh, just like to turn to that next. Uh, what we found in the process of producing the plan is that there are 7 million homes or 14 million people that are unserved with infrastructure that is capable of providing 4 megabit download speeds and 1 megabit upload speeds uh, to consumers. Uh, and so that's a significant share of the population. And so what the plan proposes to do is to reform our current universal service system by creating a Connect America fund and a mobility fund. Uh, the Connect America Fund would be capable, would build out infrastructure capable of providing four megabit down, one megabit up service to those unserved Americans and do so in a technologically neutral and financially responsible way. And the Mobility Fund would basically subsidize uh, the build out of mobile infrastructure in areas, in states rather, that uh, have mobility uh, availability that is significantly below the national average. So there are some states in the country where you only have about 70, 75, 80 percent coverage, uh, and the mobility fund is a targeted effort to uh, make sure that those numbers go up. Uh, you can read the recommendations yourself in the plan. One more small point that I'd like to note is that the plan also recommends that Congress make clear that tribal, state, local, and regional governments can build broadband networks. Uh, a lot of these governments uh, have indicated that they have an interest in building out those muni types of networks to serve their citizens, uh, and the plan recommends that Congress make clear uh, that they can do that. Just one more item on, on universal service. This is another one where there will be a series of proceedings here at the FCC over the next 12 to 18 months to sort out. Uh, this is a tricky problem. Um, but I think it's important to remember that uh, it's a fund that has had great success bringing telephone service to lots of parts of the country. And what the plan recommends is a very long-term and predictable shift in that funding from telephone to infrastructure that will support broadband that will include voice. So uh, this is one of those problems that's it's easy to get, it's easy to kind of get too excited about this and want to change everything all at once. This is one that's going to take some very measured change. That doesn't mean we should, we should uh, be lackadaisical about it, but we just should recognize this is a really complicated problem. And I was pleased that the Commission's already started to act on a series of these reforms, uh, which I think we should all watch with great interest over the, over the next little while. Absolutely. And just finally, uh, adoption, uh, as Eric indicated in his comments earlier, is also a uh, significant issue that the broadband plan tries to address. We found that about 95 percent uh, of Americans are passed by broadband infrastructure capable of meeting that four down, one up target, but only about 65 percent of American uh, households, act uh, American adults rather, actually subscribe to broadband in their home. So again, the broadband plan makes a number of recommendations, including creating a digital literacy core. Uh, under the auspices of NTIA that would basically bring together folks to increase the relevance of broadband uh, to under-adopting yeah. populations and to make sure that people have the skills necessary to take advantage of this great uh, you know, broadband opportunity that we have before us. 
uh, to increase capacity and training in libraries and community centers to provide that kind of digital literacy support, uh, to create a best practices clearinghouse and a number of other uh, targeted efforts to make sure that we make broadband uh, available to all and that we increase its uh, relevance to the people who uh, could adopt it. Just, just to highlight a couple things there and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up. Um, two points to remember on adoption. The first one is this is fundamentally a local issue. Um, the reason people choose not to adopt broadband is a very subtle problem. Uh, the research that we did, uh, which was an extensive field survey, we oversampled non-adopting populations, sort of did it in a very rigorous manner, um, shows that for those that don't adopt broadband, and that's about a third of the country, it comes down to cost, uh, literacy, and relevance. And those variables are very different depending on where you live. Uh, I'm from Chicago, and the problems on the west side of Chicago with adoption tend to be around relevance of content, particularly in English uh, be, uh, or in, in other languages other than English. The west side of Chicago has a large Spanish-speaking population. So the ways to kind of drive adoption there are different than you might find in you know, rural Arkansas, which would have a completely different set of issues. So uh, the plan wants to you know, hopefully everyone recognizes is pushing for more federal support, but in close partnership with state and local. Uh, we want to continue the BDIA funding uh, that I think most states and, and localities have benefited from, which has helped a lot of state and local governments uh, actually get work done in their communities. And that's the, the spirit of these adoption recommendations. Each situation is different, each neighborhood is different, each locality is different, and it's important that, that we work on those problems together. Um, just to wrap up, I want to spend just one minute or two on national purposes. Uh, you know, and this is really about how do we use this stuff. Um, there are, we, we sort of came to six or seven national purposes, depending on how you divide them up. Uh, I just want to highlight a couple. I heard there was someone from a healthcare facility on, so I want to make, say, a few words about healthcare. Uh, and then uh, Irene is here to talk about the E-rate, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that because you'll hear from her soon. Uh, from a healthcare standpoint, you know, we got to recognize that the country is investing a huge amount of money in electronic health records, uh, which I think is money well spent. But if you can't share those, net, those records effectively, you don't get the full value of them. So connectivity in our healthcare facilities is really important. The FCC has a, a rural health program here that uh, has done a great job trying to get broadband to some locations that don't have it. Uh, we expect that program to continue, and the plan recommends a series of reforms to it, um, basically learning the lessons from the pilot and trying to scale it up so that we get the connectivity we need in those, in those locations. The other important thing to remember about health care is uh, the plan points to, I think, a couple really important issues that are probably very clear at the local level but harder to see here in Washington, which is the need for uh, really thinking, thinking about how the incentives line up for telemedicine. Uh, when you actually talk to practitioners and patients, telemedicine is a great thing. The problem is uh, our regulatory and licensing and, and uh, disbursement systems were never designed for it. So the example I always give is that if you're a doctor at the Northwestern Hospital in Chicago and you want to have a telemedicine appointment with a patient in Gary, Indiana, which is only 30 miles away, we're not talking about like the other side of the world, because you cross a state line, you need to be licensed in Indiana to actually do that video appointment. Uh, or that patient has to get in their car and fight traffic through downtown Chicago to come to see you at the hospital. Um, that, those types of things, you know, those, it's important to have licensing. I'm not saying we shouldn't have licensing, but we should recognize that telemedicine doesn't know where a state border is. And if we want to get our specialists to the folks that need them, we need to think about how those, how those rules work. And in particular, we need to pay for that appointment because right now uh, Medicare Medicaid doesn't compensate physicians adequately for telemedicine visits. So if you're a doctor, you're not necessarily incented to do that, even though it may be the right, the right way to do it. Um, there's a whole lot more on national purposes since we're going to hear from Irene on education. And I think, uh, I believe Jennifer is coming uh, to talk about public safety. I'm not going to get any more into it uh, other than to say uh, that portion of the plan is the one I think that many years from now we'll look back on and be most excited about because while the network is interesting and I can get, you know, I, I like talking about telco networks as much as anybody, 
um, at the end of the day, it's about how does the country use these things. And I think a lot of the, the recommendations in the national purposes section will really improve uh, uh, different parts of the economy and really productive. So that's the quick tour of the plan. We've got a few minutes left for any questions that anybody has. I should mention Tom, as usual, uh, has all the right answers. Uh, make sure you visit broadband.gov because uh, we have a dashboard for the country to track our progress. Uh, and if you go to broadband.gov, you can see how the implementation is going, how the different actions that the commission are, is taking uh, are going. And you know, thus far, we're doing pretty well. Uh, it's been a very busy couple months here at the commission since the plan was released. Uh, I was very pleased to see how well uh, everyone here at the commission took up the mantle of all of this work uh, and has you know, met their schedules and proceedings are starting. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very exciting time uh, to actually implement all of these, uh, these issues. So please visit broadband.gov and make sure you uh, keep up with what we're doing. And if there are any questions, Tom and I are happy to, to take them. Anybody, either via the web or anybody on the dial-in number? No? How about this? How about I, I've heard quite a few clicks. Um, if people uh, who did not identify themselves last round, uh, let us know who's uh, on the bridge, on the, on the conference bridge. So uh, if you're there, can you let us know? Hi, this is Barrett Sheridan with the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocates. Okay, thank you. I know there are quite a few, other, quite a few others, but um, uh, I guess if we don't have any... Oh. This is Leslie Wallach at the National League of Cities. Great, thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Anybody else? I've been hearing this beep uh, about every 10 seconds, so I know there are lots of other folks out there. But uh, if, if uh, nobody else, um, if we don't have any other questions, or uh, uh, we can move on to Irene. Or does anybody have any... Feel free to email the questions in as well as anybody on the conference. Um, just uh, give us a shout out. Great. Nope. All right. Thanks, Thank Eric. you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric and Tom. We really appreciate it. And uh, we should the uh, pre your presentations will will stay up online uh, on the reboot site as, as well the webinar. Oh, we have a question. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I just had a, this is Ajane Clemens from the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. I, um, I don't know if anybody else had trouble with the website, but we weren't able to um, access the webinar. So I didn't know if some of those other late calls were people who had given up on the website and dialed in. Yeah, I, I'm so, our, our AV team and our social media team, we, were, we got one, a few emails and they, they were checking on that and they let us know that everything is running, so I, I hope it is. But we also, um, do you have any questions in particular on the National Broadband Plan? Uh, no, I'm just listening. Ah, uh, Eric, we have, we have a question from Matt Johnson at NATOA, National Association of uh, Telecom Officers. What, and Matt asked, what is the status of the Level 3 versus New York State Thruway Authority proceeding? Uh, is it safe to assume that the Commission will not prejudge the rights of way task force by acting prematurely on this proceeding? I, we could, we, I, I don't know ahead. the answer to that question. Yeah. So, I, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, I, 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 I think I could say we're not going to, uh, I don't want to speak for the Commission, but I, I should say I don't think we're going to prejudge and we're going to try to go down both tracks at once. We're looking. The uh, National Broadband Plan in uh, Recommendation 6.6 .6 .6 talks about setting up a uh, state uh, task force with, the, with um, the FCC and state, local, and tribal governments to work on the rights of way issues. So, and, it, and, and as um, Eric and Matt mentioned, uh, we're looking to get that started. And I think the broadband plan agenda uh, talks about the third quarter uh, commencing that. So we're going to move forward with that, and you know I'm not sure how the commission is going to decide to take up the level three petition. So for now, we'll we'll move forward on both tracks, I guess. I, I hope that uh, answers your question. Greg, there's another question from Fabiola Carrion, uh, oh. who's the broadband and green jobs advocate at the Progressive States Network. Uh, what do you think will be the role of states in the Connect America Fund and the Mobility Fund? Um, so good question. Couple couple thoughts on that. Um, 
as the commission sets up these two new funds uh, and we go through the rulemakings to figure out what the rules are for uh, how people will get to compete with those funds, I think it's important that state and local governments pay attention to what those rules are. And certainly, you're welcome to participate in the proceedings as, as anyone would. Um, but if, if I were in the role of a state and local government official, I'd pay close attention to those because I'd want to be helping the carriers that serve my uh, citizens uh, to make sure that they were prepared to then compete for these funds. And one appropriate role that state and local governments may have is in helping to collect data uh, in your location to help justify or argue for funding through these these new vehicles. Now that you know that's pretty far down the road. We got to figure out how these things are going to work first. Uh, it'll always come down to the rulemakings. But I think uh, if I were a state and local official, particularly if I had a significant number of underserved, uh, of unserved areas in my jurisdiction. Uh, where you know you don't have access to the proper facilities, I'd want to make sure that you have that documented so that as these things go forward and as companies start to compete for the funding to uh, provide service in those areas, you're able to articulate the need. Um, that, that would be my advice to, to all of you. Um, but again, it, it, as usual, always comes down to how the rules work and all the rest of it. But if, if I were sitting in your shoes, Fabiola, that's the type of thing that I would be paying attention to. I also think my hope is there'll continue to be a tradition of working, and I, I'm, I'm sure there will be, of working with state and local governments, particularly those that have their own USF funds already. Uh, so not every state and locality has one, but several of them do, and I think a continued partnership to make sure that those, uh, you know, that the knowledge present at the FCC is available to you all as you choose to administer those funds, I think is another uh, thing that hopefully, and I'm sure, will, uh, will continue. Anything else? Uh, I don't see anything else uh, online, so I think that's it. And thank you so much Great. to both of you for thank, taking the time today. Thanks, and I think that um, I think that last question was a perfect segue to our next speaker, uh, Irene Flannery, Deputy Division Chief of the Telecom Access Policy Division in the Wireline Competition Bureau. And uh, Irene is all things E-rate at the Commission, as well as much, much more. Thank, thank you, Irene. Thanks, Greg. Um, I, the division that I, I work with here at the Commission is the division within the Wireline Competition Bureau that works on all things universal service. So all of the issues that um, Eric and Tom were discussing in terms of implementation um, now lie rest within the Wireline Competition Bureau. Um, it, specifically today, I'm going to talk about a notice of proposed rulemaking that the Commission released last week um, on the E-rate program, which is the schools and libraries program. Um, some of the proposals included in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking um, were recommendations from the National Broadband Plan, um, and other um, issues are um, uh, not necessarily tied specifically to the Broadband Plan, but were other um, enhancements or improvements to um, the program that the Commission would propose. Just to give you a little bit of background on universal service, um, and Tom and, and Eric touched on this, but basically, um, universal service is access to telecommunication services at this juncture um, to all regions of the nation at reasonable rates um, for four enumerated categories of entities. Um, those living in rural or high-cost areas, that's what's known as our high-cost program, which um, some people refer to as USF. Um, actually, all four of these programs are encompassed within the definition of USF or the Universal Service Fund. Um, second category is low-income consumers. Some of you may know that as uh, Lifeline and LinkUp. Um, and I know there will be someone speaking this afternoon about um, Lifeline and LinkUp issues from the enforcement perspective. Um, the third program, and Eric um, spoke some about this, is the uh, rural health care program. Um, so the support goes to rural health care facilities. And then I highlighted private and public schools and libraries because that's the focus of, of uh, my remarks today. That's otherwise known as the E-rate program. Um, the 1996 Telecommunications Act codified the Commission's historical commitment to universal service. Um, and it did that by adding Section 254 to the Communications Act. And that's where you will find all of the provisions associated with universal service. The high cost and low income programs existed prior to the 1996 Act. In fact, high cost dates back probably to about the time of the 1934 Communications Act. Um, the low-income program has been in existence since 1985. 
what the 1996 Act did was it, um, it made changes, some changes to the high cost and low income programs, codified them in the FCC's rules and, um, and in the statute, um, and then added the schools and libraries program or the E-rate program and the rural health care program. Um, those programs were created after the first Universal Service Order, which was released in 1997. So those programs have been up and running since 1998. Um, just a little bit of background on the E-rate program to give you a little bit of context in terms of the changes that the Commission is contemplating um, or proposing at this juncture. Eligible schools and libraries, and we're talking about elementary and secondary schools, um, are eligible to apply for discounts on four different categories of services under the E-rate program telecommunication services, internet access, internal connections, which is basically the, uh, the pipe, um, for lack of a better term, but uh, whether a wireline or a wireless or, or a cable choice, but the, the infrastructure that is necessary to get internet access to the, the classroom and to um, computer terminals in libraries. And the fourth category is basic maintenance of internal connections. The program is currently capped at $2.25 billion per year. Um, just to give you some sense of context, the overall Universal Service Fund, including all four programs, is roughly $7.5 billion um, this year. Um, $2.25 billion of that is, um, the, is the E-rate program. Roughly $4.5 billion is attributed to high cost, a um, billion dollars for low income, and in the neighborhood of 60, 70 uh, million dollars for rural health care. For the E-rate program, the funding year runs from July 1st to June 30th of the following year. Um, in terms, uh, just a little more on background, the E-rate program runs on uh, with a series of discounts. The discounts range from 20% to 90% on eligible services, the services that I enumerated just a couple minutes ago. Um, that are available for eligible elementary and secondary schools. The percentage of the discount, and it's, it's basically referred to it as a discount matrix, which is included within our rules, um, is calculated based on the percentage of students eligible for the National School Lunch Program. That includes eligibility for both free and reduced price lunch within that program. Library discounts are based on the poverty level in the school district in which the library is located. Um, discounts uh, for the, the services are basically divided into two priorities, priority one and priority two. Uh, discounts for telecommunications and internet access services are considered priority one services. Um, the way that our rules work is that all of those requests for services from eligible schools and libraries are funded first. Um, the money that is uh, left over after all of the priority one requests are satisfied is then allocated for priority two services, which are internal connections and basic maintenance of internal connections. Um, there has only been one year in the history of the program in which all funding requests have been, we've been able to satisfy them. Um, and ever since then, demand far exceeds the uh, $2.25 billion that is available on an annual basis. The discounts vary somewhat between urban and rural areas, particularly at the lower discount levels. Once you get to the highest, the 80 and 90 percent discount levels, um, the discount is the same whether you're in an urban or rural area because of the very high levels of poverty. Um, schools and libraries are required to uh, competitively bid all of their requests for services, and they must apply for the program every year. We have a series of forms that, that the entities uh, use to apply. The program on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of submission of data and review of the applications, um, that program is, the program is administered by the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC. Um, that is an independent, not-for-profit company that um, operates under the guidance and direction of the commission um, and serves a purely administrative role. Okay. Um, now, moving on to the... Um, the notice of proposed rulemaking that the Commission adopted last week. Um, it, you'll see it referred to at, at the top of this slide as the funding year 2011 NPRM. Um, as I mentioned, the funding year for the E-rate program runs from uh, July 1st of one year through June 30th of the following year. 
Um, so all of the proposals uh, included in this notice of proposed rulemaking are proposals, if the Commission adopts them, that could be implemented for funding year 2011. That would be July 1 of 2011 through June 30th of 2012. This is the first in, in a series of um, notices of proposed rulemaking that the Commission will release with respect to the National Broadband Plan and the E-Rate Program. But these uh, were, as I said, the, um, the proposed changes that could be implemented um, more quickly than some of the other recommendations in the National Broadband Plan. Um, and what the Commission did in the NPRM um, is to take further steps toward ensuring that uh, universal access to affordable, high-quality broadband um, is available, and uh, these updates to the program will, will make that process even more effective. Um, the NPRM, as I mentioned, seeks comment on proposals that could be implemented. I, I know it sounds like it's a long time from now, but um, the way that the way in which the program operates, the the soonest that these um, proposed changes, if adopted, could be um, could be implemented, would be uh, for the funding the 2011 funding year. Uh, the proposals within the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and I'll, I'll warn you, it is a somewhat dense document. Um, there are a lot of proposals that are included, um, a lot of areas in which the Commission would like input. And they fall into four categories. First, streamlining the application process. Um, second, providing greater f flexibility to select broadband services for schools and libraries. Third, expanding the reach of broadband to the classroom. And fourth, creating a process for disposal of obsolete equipment. Um, then to break this down uh, just a little bit more in terms of each of the categories, um, in terms of streamlining the application process, the Notice of Proposal we're making seeks comment on proposals um, with respect to the technology planning requirement and the competitive bidding process, focused in particular um, on requests for service, as I mentioned, the Priority 1 versus Priority 2. Um, the Commission seeks comment on uh, perhaps changing the technology planning and competitive bidding process um, for those applicants that are seeking Priority One Telecom and Internet Access Services. There are also proposals for um, streamlining the application process that some would characterize as somewhat cumbersome. Um, and in, in conjunction with that, uh, the Commission is will also be seeking comment on changes to um, some of the specific forms um, that schools and libraries use to file to apply for E-rate funding. Um, there are also proposals to streamline the discount matrix. As I mentioned, the discounts range from 20 percent to 90 percent, um, and there um, are proposals in terms of, of perhaps making that discount matrix a bit simpler. Um, with respect to the second category of services, of, of uh, of topics that are covered in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking is providing greater flexibility to select broadband services. Um, for example, the Commission seeks comment on um, fully funding wireless services outside of school. Today, wireless services inside schools are funded under the E-rate program. But if, for example, um, uh, the E-rate program supported wireless service to a laptop on school grounds and a child took the laptop home, um, the school would be required to cost allocate um, the portion of that service that would be attributable to the usage when the device is taken off campus. So the, uh, the Commission seeks comment on is, is there a better way to do this in acknowledging that learning doesn't just happen within the classroom. Um, there are also proposals on um, providing expanded access to low-cost fiber, including, for example, unlit fiber, dark fiber. Uh, there are also proposals seeking comment on expanding access for residential schools that serve unique populations. Um, today, the residential portion of schools, because of the of the language in the um, in our existing rules, um, services have to be used for educational purposes. And so, today, if a school has a residential portion, it E-rate uh, funding cannot be used to provide service to, for example, the dorms in a residential school. So in response to a petition that was filed by the West Virginia School for the De Schools for the Deaf and Blind, uh, the Commission seeks comment on are there certain situations in which perhaps providing E-rate uh, support to services in dorms would be reasonable. So for example, 
in um, tribal schools, there are many uh, there are many boarding schools where children have no option but to attend the school. Um, those schools would be included within this proposal, um, as well as schools that serve children with unique medical or cognitive or behavioral um, challenges. Uh, there are also proposals with respect to targeting supported services for broadband. And then the final uh, category is creating a process for the disposal of obsolete equipment. Um, what these proposals try to do is strike a balance between the need to deal with obsolete equipment and what, what do you do with it. The rules and the statute um, do not allow schools to sell, to resell equipment um, that they've received um, pursuant to the E-rate program. But we are looking for perhaps a more reasonable process um, with obviously the, the need to um, balance any concerns for waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, and finally, um, we, we encourage everyone to comment um, on the variety of proposals that are included within the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Um, the comment cycle will be 30 days um, from Federal Register publication, which we hope will happen very, very soon. Um, reply comments will then be 45 days from Federal Register publication. And you may wonder why the time period is so short. But in order to implement these changes for funding year 2011, the Commission will have to adopt an order very early in the fall um, so that we can conduct the necessary outreach and our administrator has the opportunity to um, make any systems changes. The, the way the program works is there is a filing window. The filing window generally opens in November or December. So we have a limited window of time. That's why our comment period is short. Um, and um, we look forward to receiving input from state and local organizations. We know that you have a great deal of uh, information to offer to us. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Anybody on, on the conference bridge or via email? How about this? While you're thinking of questions, I think um, we had a, a question from the uh, Consumer Advocates Office from the uh, state of Connecticut from Bill Valley. Uh, concerning broadband mapping and uh, NTIA and how the FCC fits into this. So uh, we're lucky to still have Eric Gar in the room and uh, he's going to take a, uh, he's going to answer Bill's question. And I know Bill's still out there because I just uh, received an email from him. So go ahead, Eric. Hey, hey Bill. Um, you know, the, just for everybody else, his basic question is, uh, you know, the FCC, Will the FC consider working with states and developing plans for the states to best complement the national broadband plan? A lot of states are adopting individual plans, um, and while each state's a little different, there's certainly some foundational issues the FCC, may be able, FCC might be able to consolidate uh, and benefit the state. So I, I think there's kind of a two-part answer to this. Um, <laughs> the first one is hopefully everyone recognizes that we have shared an incredible amount of information online uh, as a the course of this proceeding, uh, and that will continue. Uh, the FCC, in working with NTIA, will also publish the National Broadband Map, uh, which I think is sometime uh, next, sometime in the fall. I can't remember the exact date. Um, but I think as you're preparing your own plans, there are a whole host of issues on, or uh, resources online already uh, that people can use. Um, and I think we would welcome use. And if you have you know, questions about things and, you know, we'll do our best to help here at the FCC. Uh, in terms of any more formal engagement than that, you know, we're, we're, we do have to kind of uh, retain our, remain in our jurisdiction and let you all do the things appropriate in your jurisdictions. Um, but I, my, my own view, and Greg, you may have a different view of this, so kick me if I have this wrong, is that the good folks at CGB here are very good at kind of taking questions from state and local folks that you have, making sure that they get answered appropriately in a timely fashion. And I would think, uh, as we always try to be a resource uh, to our friends in state and local government, we'll continue to do that uh, with the plan. Um, and I think if you see parts of the plan that uh, are especially relevant to you and you want to know more about it, uh, please, you know, throw the question over to CGB and we'll make sure that, that uh, we get answered. Um, and we'll continue to share tools and data as, as broadly as we can so that as you're preparing for your plan, you can go use the national broadband map, you can use uh, the tools that we have up, the speed tests that we have up, and you can start to uh, kind of use the data that we have about the country uh, for use in your particular, uh, particular locality. Yeah, we have another, uh, a bunch of other vehicles for that, including 
in the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, which was uh, reauthorized um, a few months back, and uh, we'll be uh, soliciting members uh, shortly. Uh, also, I think uh, part of the plan, I want to say, chapter somewhere in Chapter 9 deals with some of the BDIA grants, and there might be some more uh, uh, some more money coming, but that's really that's, uh, in NTIA's purview, but I think somewhere in Chapter 9 of the National Broadband Plan, which, by the way, is all online, chapter by chapter. It's really easy. You can download the, whatever uh, chapter you want and just look at that, but that, that also speaks about BDIA, uh, the uh, BDIA mapping money. Yeah, and I think all those planning grants, at least the, our view was that that was money well spent. Um, every state and local government that uh, was awarded those grants and that has kind of gotten people working on this problem have benefited. Uh, and the plan's pretty strong in saying we should continue that. Um, I know that the NTIA folks want to continue that. There's always a small matter of Congress and sort of all the details of continuing things like that. But I, I, I don't hear anyone saying it should, be, it should stop. I think as we go forward and the process works appropriately, hopefully those things will continue because uh, what I see when I go back to uh, Chicago, where, where I'm from and where I know this issue well, uh, those grants have had, a, had an impact. And uh, the state and local governments where I'm from are a better position now than they were 18 months ago um, to try and bring broadband to the parts of my community that are lacking, and hopefully that will be the same uh, the same everywhere. Okay, thank you so Great. much. And Thanks. we are going to let we are going to let Eric and uh, Tom Brown go. So uh, we're going to try to. I'd like to ask everybody out there in the cyber world to try to stick to the agenda. Um, I, I keep we keep getting a number of emails on uh, peg channels, but that's not queued up today, so we don't have the experts in the uh, room for that. So if everybody out there in the cyber world will stick to the agenda, I think that'll really help a lot, and we could move things forward and have some constructive dialogue. Uh, so. If there's anything else for Irene, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace or email now on E rate. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Irene. We uh, really appreciate it. And I know E rate is certainly uh, important for our uh, state and local governments as uh, they like to get funding for their libraries and schools. So we know it's an uh, issue um, close to their heart. Next up is um, Marcus Mayer, Deputy Bureau Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau. And I know Marcus is uh, eagerly uh, anticipated as he's going to speak about poll attachments. And um, uh, there's a uh, further notice of proposed rulemaking as well as an order coming out on that. I actually already have a uh, question in advance of Marcus um, speaking on uh, how do poll attachment recommendations apply to states that have the authority to regulate? Uh, and that's from uh, Washington State. But we'll let Marcus uh, do his presentation, and we'll see if he covers that question. So uh, Emmett, is he queued up? Thank you. Well, and um, thank you very much. And uh, as, as was noted, I'm here to talk about the um, item that the Commission recently released. It's a uh, order and further notice of proposed rulemaking um, regarding poll attachment issues. And I thought I would start with a little bit of a <clears throat> statutory background regarding um, kind of the scope and the nature of the Commission's authority to regulate poll attachments. Um, Section 224 of the Communications Act is what uh, establishes the Commission's authority to um, regulate access to polls and the, the sort of basic responsibilities of the Commission are to ensure that the rates and terms for um, access to, to poll attachments are just and reasonable um, as well as to ensure that utilities provide uh, cable television systems and telecommunications carriers um, with non-discriminatory access to polls. Um, as the as a question I got somewhat uh, anticipated, um, there are some some exclusions from the statute, and I'll uh, 
for now just highlight a couple of them. Um, one of the statutory exclusions is that the, the utilities that are regulated under Section 224 exclude um, railroads or uh, government-owned entities or cooperatives. So if you have a, you know, a municipal-owned utility or a cooperative telephone company um, that's a pole owner, those entities are not subject to the FCC's um, rules and authority over pole attachments. Uh, the other significant exclusion that I'll mention is that um, states that have certified to the FCC that they regulate pole attachments um, also are not subject to the FCC's jurisdiction. So um, the FCC's enforcement authority, the FCC's rules governing pole attachments do not extend to those states and it's 19 states plus the District of Columbia so far that have certified that they regulate pole attachments. So um, parties that uh, have concerns about access to polls would take that up at the, through the state processes and procedures instead of relying on um, the FCC's framework. Uh, in recent years, there has been a lot of attention um, re relating to poll access in the context of broadband and spurring um, broadband and de deployment. Uh, in 2007, the FCC issued a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking that um, recognized this link between uh, pole attachments and broadband and um, sought comment on a number of issues, mostly dealing with uh, pole access rates, um, but also dealing with uh, sort of access policies and, and enforcement mechanisms. And um, the National Broadband Plan likewise recognized this link uh, and, uh, and, and included um, a number of specific recommendations relating to pole attachments um, as an, in an effort to um, sort of better, better utilize this infrastructure to promote uh, broadband deployment and availability. And the, the specific recommendations are that the FCC should establish um, rental rates for pole attachments that are as low and close to uniform as possible, consistent with Section 224 of the Act, to promote broadband deployment. Um, the, the issue there is uh, that, that, that different types of providers um, can end up paying different pool rental rates depending upon the, the kind of the regulatory classification of the, the provider. Um, as I mentioned when I was discussing the statutory background, the, um, the uh, provisions of Section 224 cover pool attachments by um, cable television systems and telecommunications carriers. Uh, the statute also specifies um, two different uh, formulas or methodologies for uh, calculating the, um, uh, the poll rental rate for those different types of providers. And uh, as the commission has um, implemented those two different formulas in the past, the, the end result was that in general, the, the rate paid by telecom carriers for, for example, a foot of space on a poll tended to be um, sort of several times higher potentially than the, the rate that a cable television system would pay for, for that access. And um, the National Broadband Plan observed that uh, there is potential for that to have uh, sort of a disincentive effect on broadband and deployment and availability um, in several ways. Uh, one was that to the extent that a cable operator was paying the lower rate today, it might be discouraged from offering telecommunications services given the risk that all of its um, pull rates could then potentially increase to the telecom rate. Um, and in theory also the, the kind of the uh, a higher cost, particularly in rural areas, could um, either increase the cost or at the margins uh, discourage um, new, new deployments of uh, broadband by telecommunications carriers. So the plan recommends that the um, commission within the statutory framework um, seek to minimize that difference by um, uh, tr trying to see if there are ways to lower the telecom rate um, to be uh, cl as close as possible to the cable rate. Um, the second recommendation and the, the third recommendation deal with um, poll access issues. So the second recommendation says that the FCC should implement rules that will lower the cost of poll attachment make ready process and the third recommendation is that the FCC should establish a comprehensive timeline 
for each step of the Section 224 access process and reform the process for resolving disputes regarding um, infrastructure access. Uh, historically, when the FCC has implemented Section 224 um, in the context of uh, issues of poll access rather than poll rates, um, the Commission adopted uh, a few kind of general guiding principles and then um, left to the subsequent enforcement process um, the, the kind of the resolution of specific disputes regarding um, poll access issues. And um, so, some, some parties, both in terms of attachers and in terms of um, poll owners, have uh, expressed some concerns about um, whether that enforcement approach has been adequate to address the concerns that have arisen um, attachers in terms of ensuring that they have timely access when you know, potentially a formal enforcement process could um, linger on for, for some period of time. And from the perspective of utilities, um, concerns have been expressed about um, you know, the, the impact of some of the enforcement policies on, uh, on things like unauthorized attachers or um, the incentives of parties when negotiating agreements. So the National Broadband Plan recommended that the, the Commission sort of re reconsider its approach in, in two respects. One is, in some areas, consider um, uh, more definitive um, rules than just the gen general guidelines, and in other respects, um, evaluate its enforcement policies to ensure that um, they are working in the, in the most effective way possible. Um, the, the final recommendation is that the FCC should improve the collection and availability of information regarding the location and availability of poles, ducts, conduits, and right-of-way. And, and this really um, kind of builds upon a lot of the recommendations that um, came before it in the sense that uh, the more information um, that the, the parties have, both attachers and poll owners, about uh, the infrastructure that's out there and how it's being used, um, the more efficiently the attachment process can work um, without the need for uh, intervention and, and, and certainly having um, appropriate information available to the Commission can help in, uh, in ongoing policy making as well. So those sort of set the stage for the recent um, order and further notice that the Commission issued dealing with these poll attachment issues. Uh, as, a, as a threshold matter, the Commission issued an order dealing with um, s certain principles that um, sort of as a, just as a matter of the statute, the Commission felt like it was important to clarify. Uh, one of the things that the Commission held was that the statutory non-discrimination requirement allows attachers to take advantage of um, space or cost-saving methods of attaching to poles where it's practical and where it's consistent with the poll owner's own use of those techniques. So it's not requiring poll owners to go beyond what they have found to be safe and practical um, based on their own policies, but just ensuring that, um, that, that, that those are implemented in a non-discriminatory way. And the, the second issue that the Commission um, clarified in the order portion of the item was that the statutory right to just and reasonable um, access to polls includes the right to timely access. Uh, the timeliness of access has been one of the um, uh, more debated issues in some of the poll attachment proceedings, and uh, the Commission here made clear that the, the statute itself requires it, but left many of the details of, for example, a specific timeline to consideration in the further notice of proposed rulemaking. And um, as, as Irene said, with the E-rate item, there are uh, many, many details in, in the um, poll attachment further notice as well. I'm not going to try to get into every single one of them, but just highlight some of the main categories of issues that are taken up here. Uh, and the, the, the three main categories are access issues, enforcement issues, and rate issues. And, and the access issues, as I alluded to earlier, um, the, uh, is consistent with the, the importance of um, poll access to deployment not only for broadband, for, for other types of competitive communication services as well, um, it's important to make sure that uh, the, that attachers are able to get on in a timely manner and um, utilize sort of efficient and cost-effective ways of attaching to polls, such as um, outside contractors, 
but to also uh, fully reflect and incorporate the, the, the need for safety, reliability, and sound engineering because of the, the sort of the importance and the significance of this infrastructure, not just for communication services, but for electricity, for power, um, for other things as well. So the further notice seeks comment on a number of um, specific proposals. Uh, in many of these cases, um, the Commission has learned a great deal from um, what commenters have brought to our attention regarding state efforts on um, access issues. And uh, as you'll see in the item, the, the Commission seeks to um, borrow from those experiences and learn from those experiences uh, in crafting its own um, proposed policies. In the enforcement context, um, the item proposes uh, some changes to make sure that our enforcement rules get the incentives right as it relates to both informal and formal complaint processes. So making sure that um, the Commission's rules don't inadvertently um, discourage someone from relying on an informal process because of the need to, for example, preserve their rights for a formal dispute. Um, at the same time, making sure that when someone does take advantage of the, the, the formal dispute process, um, you know, the incentives are right to, to you know, avail themselves of that and, and that there uh, are appropriate um, outcomes that are available for uh, dealing with disputes through an enforcement process. Uh, the, the third category of issues is are the rate issues. One of them I alluded to before, which is that um, the, the, as interpreted by the Commission thus far, um, the telecommunications rate formula in general yields a um, higher pool rental rate than the cable rate formula and that disparity can um, lead to some potential uh, uh, disincentives in terms of communications um, deployment. Uh, the other issue that I hadn't mentioned so far is the, the way Section 224 deals with incumbent local telephone companies. Um, and as I mentioned, the Section 224 covers telecommunications carriers However, it defines telecommunications carriers in a way that excludes incumbent lo local telephone companies. Um, however, elsewhere in Section 224, there is reference to not telecommunications carriers, but providers of telecommunications service. And so that has led to um, you know, ar arguments about whether or not uh, or to what extent um, incumbent local telephone companies are entitled to uh, regulated rates or other types of protections under Section 224. So that is a, a, an additional issue that the um, Commission takes on. Uh, the comment period um, is somewhat shorter for this proceeding, 30 days for comments and an additional 30 for replies, because this issue, as I mentioned, is sort of a further notice building off of a 2007 notice of proposed rulemaking where some of the similar issues were, were, were raised and um, the, from, from the, the record in the broadband plan proceeding that also included a significant comment on this. Um, we recognize that, that you know, even though the statute excludes uh, the states that, that have certified that they regulate pool attachments, um, even though the statute excludes, for example, you know, municipal owned utilities, things like that, um, the, as the item itself reflects, we feel like there, there can be real benefits from learning from the experiences of those type of providers. Um, Obviously, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is consistent with our own statutory framework, but um, it's, it's always helpful for us to, to hear examples of what's been successful in other contexts. And additionally, for those states that are subject to um, the FCC's jurisdiction as it relates to pool attachments, the Commission historically has um, recognized that those states have significant expertise on issues of um, safety, reliability, and things like that. And so we continue to um, welcome the, the inside of states on uh, those issues as well as any other um, experiences that they have that, that can help us inform our process. And with that, I'll take questions if there are any. Yeah, I, hi, Marcus. We have, um, uh, we have one from the uh, state of Connecticut uh, online. It's printing out, but let me read it to you. Um, this question is from uh, Bill Valley, uh, an attorney with the uh, State of Connecticut Office of Consumer Counsel. Um, says, Marcus, you have mentioned that 19 states have opted out of the FCC jurisdiction. Also that the National Broadband Plan will address the issues 
with lower and consistent costs for all attachments plus make ready issues. The Connecticut Department of, U uh, Department of Public Utilities has opted out and has extensively and has extensively, um, excuse me, Marcus has uh, mentioned that 19 states has, uh, have opted out of the FCC's jurisdiction, also that the National Broadband Plan will address the issues of lower and consistent cost for all attachments, plus make ready issues. The Connecticut Department of Public Utilities has opted out and has extensively addressed make ready issues. Additionally, two electric companies, both owners of, pole regu of poles in the regions, have both attempted to sharply raise prices. Can you express, can you state whether the FCC will preempt state regulations in public rights of way? Will the FCC have jurisdiction to regulate electric company owned polls? So I think we're getting into the rights of way issues again. Well, I think, I mean, um, I, th I think one thing I'll just reiterate is uh, the, the, the statute is clear that the, the states that um, have certified that they regulate poll attachments are not within the FCC's jurisdiction. Our rules um, don't encompass them today. Nothing in the item that the commission, commission recently released um, would try to change that, nor could we. So uh, I guess I would say to the extent that states have opted out or, or do so in the future, there's nothing that we're doing that, that would, um, would change that through our uh, rulemaking process. And you know, likewise, so the, the, the commission's jurisdiction to regulate um, electric company-owned polls um, if they're uh, not a you know, government-owned um, or cooperative utility, and if they're not in a state that uh, regulates poll attachments itself, um, you know, in general, that would be subject to the, the FCC's authority and rules. Um, the, the, the public rights-of-way issue is another one that I think was taken up in the broadband plan, and um, uh, I think I will just defer to, the, to what the plan has to say on, on that specific right. issue. Yeah, and as we mentioned, we'll be kicking off that uh, task force in the third quarter, but um, I, I guess it's sort of a separate issue from the poll attachments, so we just want to keep them separate. Anybody else on poll attachments while Marcus is here? Uh, this is Chris White from the Jury Division of Right Council. I have a kind of the reverse question. These rules that are being a being proposed once they're adopted, I assume any of these states that, that have that regulated could adopt those rules and enforce those rules as their rules. Is that correct? That I mean that would be that would be up to the states to decide for themselves. So that would be a question I think of, you know, what what was the state regulatory scheme, what does the state statute say? Um, my sense is that there are some states that at least in some respects follow some of the FCC's rules, but that's that's a choice on their part. But there'd be no prohibition for states that, that to adopt those rules if they chose to. Uh, no, no prohibition by the FCC. It would be it would be just a question of what could, what they could do under their state law. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, our next speaker is kind of pressed for time. Thank you very much, Marcus. It was excellent. I think uh, very informative for uh, all our people out there on the net and on the dial in bridge. Our next speaker is Jennifer Manor, Deputy Bureau Chief in the Public Safety uh, Bureau, and she's going to speak about um, public, the uh, public safety and the National Broadband Plan. So without further ado, here's Jennifer okay. Emmett. Do you have that up? Okay, well, I can start. Thank Go you very ahead. much. Um, so I'm focused on, and my discussion is going to focus on Chapter 16 of the National Broadband Plan. And when you think about Chapter 16, our mandate was to look at how to use broadband to improve the public safety and homeland security of the country. And we focused on three broad areas. The first was creating a nationwide interoperable broadband wireless public safety network. The second area was very much focused on consumer issues. And in that regard, two key areas were a focus of the broadband plan, Next Generation 911, and next generation alerting. And the third area that I'm gonna focus on is enhancing security measures to safeguard network infrastructure and core infrastructure. So that's things like cybersecurity. How do we protect our cybersecurity, our cyber infrastructure? So with that, I'm gonna start with the first area, which is the nationwide interoperable public safety wireless broadband network. And um, this was an important area um, for us because um, one of the things that 
one of the things that's um, been an issue for the country is that today there's still not a solid interoperable approach for communications across the country for our public safety, for our first responders. And secondly, um, there's certainly not nationwide interoperability. And third, today public safety does not have adequate access to broadband capabilities. So the capabilities that my mother has on her iPhone, many first responders do not have access to. So a broad focus of the broadband plan was to look at how do we improve broadband access for our first responders. And what we first did was we made a decision um, that we were going to encourage incentive-based partnerships. And that meant moving public safety from traditional siloed communications infrastructure to more commercially based infrastructure so that folks would end up with the same applications and access to the same sorts of technology that are available to each of us today in many of our own communities. Um, we broke the broadband network strategy into three areas. The first being an administrative and technical regime, the second being fo focused on interoperability, and the third on funding. With regard to administrative and technical regime, um, we are actually encouraging public safety entities to deploy and operate their public safety broadband networks with commercial partners. And we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but it's really a cost savings measure. Um, and also an ability to ensure that they have access to the latest technology as well as um, the ability to upgrade their networks and that letting their networks evolve. The second area was um, we wanted to make sure that public safety had adequate access to capacity for communication services in the case that their own networks were unavailable or congested. And so one of the broadband plan's recommendations was to ensure that there was priority access and roaming across other, other broadband commercial communications networks, wireless networks. Um, one benefit to this, besides for the increased capacity, it also provides for increased redundancy um, in the case of a system being down. Uh, further, um, we also recommended that there should be user device requirements. And one of the requirements was there's a, there's a piece of spectrum located adjacent to the public safety broadband spectrum called the D-Block, and the D-Block is going to be a commercially licensed frequency band. And one of the recommendations was there should be user devices required by the D-Block licensee to see the public safety broadband spectrum. And in this way, it would help ensure that there's um, consumer electronic price devices available for public safety. So that's the administrative and technical regime. The second area we focused on was the emergency res was interoperability. And we proposed, and the FCC has already created something called the Emergency Response Interoperability Center, or ERIC. And ERIC is charged with ensuring that the, ne that the networks achieve nationwide interoperability. The third area is funding. And funding, I think, is most critical because without funding, you'll never have a nationwide system. And what we did was we, um, we did a cost model to determine what it would cost to provide service to 99% of the population of the United States. And that amount um, cost about $6.5 billion. And we also factored in operating costs. And in year 10, when the network's fully built out, it comes out to $1.3 billion a year. Um, that's okay. Sorry, we're just getting to the slides. Um, $1.3 billion a year. So we've actually recommended substantial funding, a total of about, um, just doing the math quick, somewhere between 12 and $16 billion over 10 years to fund the construction and deployment and operation of this network. So what does that get you? Um, really quite a, a robust system. So you've got as your basis the public safety broadband wireless network, and that's supplemented by the commercial wireless network. Our cost model also includes um, uh, funding for DAS and microcell systems and deployable caches of equipment. Those would be things like uh, cell towers on wheels, which would be deployed throughout regions so that they could be brought in during times of emergency. So overall, this is a very exciting plan <coughs> which should result in the deployment of a public safety broadband network across the country in less than 10 years. With that said, just as an update, um, the FCC, 
a week or two ago, I can't remember the exact day, um, issued 21, um, granted 21 waivers to begin early build out of the public safety broadband networks. So we've already taken action both in terms of establishing ERIC and moving forward with authorizing some early builders. Um, the other piece, just this was not an FCC action, this was NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, but they actually, once we granted the waivers, they reopened their current round of funding to allow those waiver applicants to apply for, for grants to build out their network. So that's an exciting piece. The next area we're going to focus on is the consumer issues. And we're going to start with Next Generation 911. And what's really exciting about Next Generation 911 is it's bringing emergency communications into the broadband age. So not only are we talking about 911 centers being able to receive text messages, but video, um, photos, other things. So things, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're driving down the street and there's a fire alongside the road. So besides just calling 911 and saying, I see a fire, here's the location, you're also able to send a picture. And then using the public safety broadband network, the dispatcher would be able to dispatch, provide that information to the emergency responder. Um, so this is an area that we think is critical. Um, it will better equip emergency responders and enable um, citizens to be report um, important information. So we've made a few key recommendations. Um, one of the issues was cost in getting this network deployed, and our record didn't establish exactly what the cost would be. So one of the things we proposed or recommended was that the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration prepare a report on the costs associated with next generation 911 deployment, and that be used as a basis for Congress to look at and see if it makes sense to fund development of these services and these networks. Um, the second area that's plagued 911 is that there's been a lot of disparity in state and local regulations, so we've recommended the establishment of a regulatory framework on the federal level to help spur next generation 911. And then two proceedings at the FCC to look at things like the impact of location accuracy requirements and also how next generation 911 architecture would have to, would come into play and what, would, what changes that would cause to our rules. The next exciting area is next generation alerting. And probably a lot of you remember um, when you were young on the television, there used to be a beep, or there still is, and says this is a test of the emergency alerting system. Um, this would really bring next generation alerting into the 21st century. Um, and this is an area um, that's still very early on. We're working with our federal partners on how to progress it. So one of the areas we focused on was um, making sure there was a clarification um, with the executive branch of which agencies have the lead on this issue. And then secondly, we thought it was also very important that the FCC establish a uh, inquiry proceeding to look at next generation alerting issues. The last area I'm going to touch on is cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. With broadband becoming more pervasive, um, we really looked at what the Commission's role should be and what the government's role should be in cybersecurity and ensuring that our, our broadband infrastructure is protected. Um, so our first recommendation was to actually, for the FCC to create a roadmap of the hottest areas, the top five areas it should be looking at with regard to cybersecurity um, over the next two years. Um, and then we really looked at what gaps we could fill. And we focused on um, really three key areas. The first was outage reporting. We currently um, have outage reporting for traditional communications carriers and whether that should be extended to, to broadband service providers. Um, and similarly, we have a voluntary system we administer with DHS called DERS, whether we should create something for cybersecurity called SIRS that would also um, give us outage reporting and other types of information. And finally, something called the Voluntary Cybersecurity Certification. Um, and our, our issue here was we wanted to make sure that there was a way to encourage folks to engage in best practices with regard to cybersecurity. So if you met certain best practices, you get an FCC good housekeeping seal of approval. This is a proceeding we've already started and is underway. The next area we looked at was critical infrastructure. All of a sudden we have this broadband world and how do we ensure that the infrastructure is protected? So we recommended two key proceedings. Um, one focused on network resilience and preparedness and one focused on network 
um, reliability and resiliency. We've already started one of those proceedings. And then we had some, um, some recommendations focused on extending priority access and route, routing, which is uh, a form of service that's provided to national security um, personnel during emergencies where they get higher priority on, on, on phone calls to broadband as well. So that's a quick overview. Um, Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, we apologize for any technical difficulties. Jennifer's um, PowerPoint will be made available online at the Reboot site, as will all presentations today. I've also been getting a few emails um, uh, noting that people have been um, uh, sort of uh, knocked off the live stream. If anybody who's on the conference bridge can uh, let us know if uh, you're still on that and if our AV folks uh, and social media folks uh, could also work on getting us back up online and so everybody could have access to this, that would be great. Uh, anybody out there on, on the conference bridge or via email have questions for Jennifer concerning the um, uh, public safety's role in the National Broadband Plan? I know there's a lot and I know um, public safety is always a huge issue for state and local governments. I know at the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee we always have a lot of questions so uh, okay. now's a very good time. I have a question about next generation alerting. Yes, who's, sir. And who's this and where are you uh, calling from? Yeah, Jack McFadden. I'm calling from Tennessee. I'm member of NASTD. She mentioned um, an effort to identify who the federal partners were or who was in the lead uh, regarding next generation alerting. I'm curious who that is. Um. Well, it, it, it's traditional. There's actually an executive order that, that exists today, and it's uh, FEMA and the National Weather Service are two of our partners. And really, we're not saying who's the lead, but we wanted to put in, we wanted to recommend that there would be milestones put in place to help guide the process. So it's really a joint effort. Thank you. Oh, great. Anybody else? Yes, uh, this is Earl Pelcher from Florida Office of Public Counsel. Jennifer, uh, in uh, 2007, the Joint Board recommended that uh, we extend mobility uh, to all state and federal highways uh, to provide nine, E911 access uh, in those areas that do not have it today. Uh, anything happening uh, in your broadband plan in that regard? Um, no, that, that'll be subject no, that we, we didn't address that issue. Okay. Anybody else? And I think our live stream is back up and running as I've been getting a bunch of emails. So um, we apologize for that. But again, the, the full uh, webcast will be, you could go back and watch this in fall on the uh, Reboot site as well as pull up all the presentations. And then my contact information is on the presentation. Yeah, and, and Jennifer's contact information is on the presentation as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I'm very lucky to have Jennifer today. Great. Our uh, next presenter is also from the uh, Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Uh, Roberto Musenden is a senior attorney there. Um, he's been there a number of years, and we're very lucky to have him. Roberto will be talking about narrow banding, which uh, should be a big issue for all of your um, state and local governments, uh, police, fire departments, public safety. Uh, public safety um, folks as I believe narrow banding is occurring this year. So um, uh, please pay attention to Roberto. Good afternoon. Uh, the focus of this presentation was more geared towards your first responders and their ability to communicate some of the concepts um, towards more of the decision makers, um, the check cutters, whether it's the Board of Aldermen, uh, city councils. So it's an overview to a, in many ways, they knew the information and it was a way to allow us to give them the tools they needed to make, um, to make the case for themselves. Basically, anybody who's operating in what's known as the UHF and VHF bands, uh, which is 150 to 174 and 421 to 512, they are predominantly some of the most popular public safety bands for uh, basically they've been around forever and they propagate very well. What has to happen is by 2013 licensees have to operate at 12 and a half kilohertz uh, bandwidth 
or they've got to use a technology that makes it uh, that efficient. There are two dates that are um, of import here. They both are January 1, 2011, and what people have told me when I've talked about them is they would have actually preferred we made it December 31st, 2010 and December 31st, 2012, because people tend to focus, uh, if they see that it's at a 2010 deadline, they start focusing in 2010, but if they see 2011, they go, we got time. In 2011, we are not going to accept any more applications for new systems that use wideband technology, which is 25 kilohertz channels or modification applications that expand an existing footprint. So at that point, we will continue to accept applications for existing facilities, but as long as they don't expand the service area. But we will not accept any more applications for uh, new systems that are wideband. We also put in a uh, pair of um, prohibitions on equipment, and this is to uh, we prohibit the manufacture, importation, or certification of equipment that contains a 25 kilohertz mode. Most equipment now is dual band, uh, dual mode. It can operate in either wide band or narrow band mode. As of the beginning of next year, we will not be allowed any more sales that are wide band only. Uh, and also the third was that any new equipment being certified as of January 1 next year would have to have a six and a quarter bandwidth specification. Let me jump in here because as Roberto said, he said, that, you know, this presentation is really geared to a lot of folks who are down in the down in the weeds. But for um, uh, mayors, the folks at uh, National Governors Association, state legislators, this is really important for all of your jurisdictions uh, in terms of the equipment you purchase and and you need to look at the certifications. And Roberto's presentation will be up online, and we would encourage you to. Um, have your uh, 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 first responders, uh, police, fire, EMS, you know, point them to this presentation and, and they'll know the specifics. But um, it's really important in terms of your budgets. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Roberto. No, I, no. Just, I just really wanted to point that out to you. So please, when you go back, I know the state and local organizations are all online. So please filter this down to, um, to, to, to all your members. And the second date, 2013, <laughs> is essentially all operations in these two bands must be operating at 12 and a half uh, bandwidth. So there will be no more wideband operations. The next couple slides, basically the, the takeaway from this is that this is a process that began in 1991 and has had a lot of uh, rulemaking iterations that have sort of pushed the date back, refined the parameters. Now, here are the five reasons to narrow band, opportunity, compliance, interoperability, interference, and obsolescence. Essentially, opportunity is that by reducing the bandwidth, we give more users the opportunity to operate on this spectrum, which again is very valuable spectrum in terms of its physical properties. These are details of how the bands will look before and after narrow banding in both the VHF and there the UHF bands. Compliance. Narrow banding is a mandatory process. If you are not narrow banded, it is not that you are on a secondary basis, you're out of compliance. Non-compliance stations are prohibited. More importantly, non-compliance can negatively impact your public safety first responders. They may not be able to communicate with non-narrow-banded systems. If you're operating wideband, you may not be able to communicate with a narrow-banded system. To your, neighbor. to your neighbors or within other agencies. Maybe a, uh, you know, a, a sister agency hasn't narrow-banded yet. Your radio may not be able to pick up their signal or their signal may overload your radio. Beginning in 2013, we're going to allow new stations to come in on what used to be wideband channels. So wideband operations are no longer going to be protected from interference. If you begin to suffer interference in these situations, it will be a non-compliant station 
essentially in competition with a uh, station that's operating in accordance with the FCC rules, and that will be something that the Enforcement Bureau will have to uh, uh, look at. So, so basically if the public safety uh, station gets stepped on by a compliant uh, non-public safety uh, transmission, that, that's it? It would well. Or it could interfere. It, it could interfere, interfere, and we would ask both sides to, you know, as we always do, to take out. the steps to mitigate the interference. But in terms of who would have the greater rights, if it will, it would be the station that's in compliance. And, and more importantly, in an emergency situation, you exactly. Don't want to be in that situation. Okay. The next week is obsolescence. When we put this proceeding together, we based it upon basically the uh, tax code, which said where you use depreciation, and most businesses depreciate radio equipment over a seven-year period. Now, I understand public safety's depreciation uh, period is basically until it falls apart, but unfortunately that varies from agency to agency. But what has happened, based upon the rules that have been in place, is that if you have wideband only equipment, it is at least 12 years old. And replacement parts for that equipment or replacement models for that equipment will not be available after next year. More importantly, as the system ages, the parts become scarcer as well as support for it becomes scarcer and again becomes more expensive. So these are some of the steps that agencies need to do to take care to start going down through the narrow banding route. First, decide whether or not these uh, UHF, VHF systems uh, are still needed. Maybe 700 and 800 megahertz systems may be able to take up, the, uh, uh, take up that need. It may be a time to inventory what you have in terms of radio assets because anything built since 1997 has to have had a narrow band mode. So it may be nothing more than contacting the manufacturers and finding out how to reprogram existing systems. If, however, you are still thinking about putting in a new system between now and the end of the year, please keep it narrow banded. Go ahead and, go ahead and build a new narrow band system to avoid having to go through the narrow banding heartache. The next slide is uh, actually my boss and his position on uh, waivers. And I like my job, so I don't contradict my boss in public. And then these are some more on how to go ahead, path to compliance. Um, inventory. You may have to do uh, some site engineering because the narrowing bandwidth may reduce some coverage. So you'll just have to take a look at your propagation, see how that works. See if pagers need replacement. More importantly, work backwards from compliance from 2013 and work backwards to understand when certain steps have to be taken. Get the funding cycle approved. And um, license modification, we're now able to do it through ULS without, uh, without frequency coordination. Here's the big one, funding. We don't do, we have no grants here in our agency. However, we work very well with the uh, DHS, Office of Emergency Communications, as well as FEMA. And we have an email up there, contact for OEC, as well as uh, FEMA's website to see if there might be grant money available that can support operability and interoperability, that sometimes that can uh, cover some of the narrow banding costs. From this slide, um, we, some of the things that affect narrow banding are the ability to go ahead and make changes to the license without requiring frequency coordination. Um, and this is good for just some of the technical aspects of it that are, uh, don't incur an additional cost anymore. We also have before us a petition for stay of some of the 2011 interim deadlines that's currently uh, before the commission. This is actually a very uh, valuable brochure that is put together by uh, a couple of the frequency coordinators, the IMSA, and I know the 
uh, International Association of uh, Fire Chiefs. And this is available online at uh, their websites, both of these organizations' websites. And it goes through and provides a very good background uh, to narrow banding, what the rules are, and again, some, uh, in greater detail, some of the things that I spoke about today. And I turned it off. <laughs> and essentially, it's uh, geared towards non-technical audience. And it's a great tool for folks to come in and bring it forward you know, when they need funding requests. And here's some contact information. The first one is myself. The second one is a uh, Zenji Nakazawa, who is one of my coworkers in my bureau. Um, again, we're more than happy to take questions. If we don't know the answer, we will try and find the people who do. Um, and we understand that this is a big, big effort, and we're willing to support it in the ways that we can. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Anybody on the uh, conference bridge or calling in? And I know we have a National Conference of State Legislators out there and, and a lot of other organizations who do uh, budgetary stuff, uh, budgetary uh, issues for state and local government. So, um, you know, please contact your police, fire, your police and fire chiefs. And, uh, and I'm sure they already know about this issue as Roberta has been going around the country giving this presentation. But again, this is uh, very important for all of your first responders and uh, in building out any new systems that you'll have. Um, so, anybody? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, again, Roberto's uh, presentation will stay up there. You can contact him or you can contact uh, myself, Gregory Vadis, gregory.vadis at FCC.gov, and I'd be uh, happy to work with our friends at the Public Safety Bureau as we do on a regular basis. And I think uh, I don't see anything coming in in the inbox. So I think uh, that's it for now. Thank okay. you very much, Great. Roberto, and uh, thank Jennifer for us. That was uh, super. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, our next uh, presentation is going to be on something that's also uh, um, uh, important for uh, state and local governments. It's uh, uh, wireless, uh, or I should say tower siting. Um, and this is always a big issue as to where do you put the uh, cell tower. And we're, we have, we're very lucky to have Aaron Goldschmidt, um, Assistant uh, Chief of the Policy Division in uh, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. So I'm going to let Aaron go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'd like to briefly discuss the Commission's November 2009 declaratory ruling that set time frame for state and local authorities to decide applications requesting new facilities or co-locations on existing facilities to provide wireless services. Next slide. Somebody moving the slides. Oh, I'm sorry. You, oh. you can work the slides. Ah, okay. if you would. Excuse me. If you want to help you out with that. Section 332C7 of the Communications Act provides general deference to state and local governments regarding the placement, construction, and modification of wireless facilities. The Act requires that state and local governments decide siting applications within a reasonable period of time. The Act permits applicants to commence court action within 30 days of a, quote, final action or failure to act by a state or local government on a wireless facility siting application. The declaratory ruling established time frames for state and local processing of tower siting applications. The record in the proceeding demonstrated that co-location applications can typically be processed by state and local governments within 90 days, and new tower applications can be processed within 150 days. Moreover, the evidence submitted by local governments indicates that most already are processing applications within 90 and 150 days. Accordingly, the declaratory ruling established that 90 days is presumed to be a reasonable time within which state and local authorities should act on co-location applications and 150 days is presumed reasonable for all other tower siting applications. Once these time frames have expired and an application has not been acted upon, a siting applicant has 30 days to file a claim in court. Two things to note about the time frames that the declaratory ruling establishes. First, the parties can agree to extend the review period. Second, state and local governments have 30 days from the time the application is submitted to review it. If the application is found to be incomplete, the time it takes for an applicant to respond to a request for additional information within the first 30 days does not count toward the 90 or 150 day review periods. 
However, requests for additional information after 30 days do not toll the review periods. I should note that a petition for reconsideration has been filed asking that the Commission allow state and local governments to toll the review periods whenever they need additional information from the applicant or outside parties. And that petition is currently pending. After the expiration of the time frame, an applicant may go to court if a state or local government has not acted upon the application, and state and local governments will have the opportunity to rebut the presumption that the time frame was reasonable based on the specific facts of the application. The court will then fashion the appropriate case-specific remedy. The declaratory ruling does not deem any application granted without a court hearing, nor does it establish any presumption in favor of any type of relief. So that's a quick description of what the Commission decided in the declaratory ruling. Now we'd like to hear from you. The declaratory ruling went into effect six months ago, and we're interested in getting your take on how it's working. We'd like to know if applications are being processed within the presumptive periods of reasonableness, if applicants are routinely going to court, are tolling agreements being re reached, and of course, we ha if you have any questions beyond that, please feel free to ask. Anybody? I imagine tower siting and the um, uh, the uh, clock is a uh, uh, issue for you folks in the state and local government. So um, I'd actually be surprised if we didn't have any questions on this uh, on uh, this one. No. Okay. Uh, sometimes why don't we just give it a minute. Sometimes it takes a minute or two for the emails oh. to to um, bounce back in. Uh, Okay, um, I guess uh, uh, that's it, Aaron. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have something. Oh, you know what? Uh, uh, we're going to print this question out and bring it right over to you. We have a question from uh, Natoa in Tower Sighting. Uh, has the FCC received any data regarding the practical impact on the order? In other words, has the FCC heard of any <laughs> suits filed under this order and to what extent? Do you think this data would be helpful? Uh, uh, we are aware that NATOA has raised this issue. Uh, I guess it's an issue in a column showed up, but I guess in TR Daily today discussing some of these issues, and I understand uh, NATOA will be if they haven't already filing something asking about this and we are not aware of anything beyond what appeared in that article at this time we don't have any of the data at present okay um anything anything else oh i guess there was a second question yeah. what is the status of the bureau's review of natoa's petition for reconsideration do we have a time frame um we are drafting it we are hoping mm -hmm. to uh get that out as soon as possible but i okay. do not have a time frame i can offer up today Okay, great. Uh, oh, let me see if we have anything else coming in. One second. I think that's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to take a. Uh, we're going to take a. Oh, you know what? We're going to um, see who's up next. Is it? Uh, Oh, Cynthia Bryant. Great. The, uh, our next presentation will be on um, Lifeline and LinkUp from an enforcement perspective. Earlier today, um, uh, and uh, Cindy Bryant, a senior attorney in the um, uh, Telecommunications Consumer Division of the uh, Enforcement Bureau will be giving the presentation on Lifeline and LinkUp, and these are programs to help uh, low-income consumers, one, uh, initially get linked up to get started, um, uh, to get to get a um, phone installation in their house to get linked up, thus the word, li thus the title link up, as well as Lifeline, and that's the uh, continuing support with the bills for low-income uh, consumers. And uh, Cindy Bryant's gonna talk about this uh, program from the Enforcement Bureau's perspective. So thank you very much, Cindy, and it's in your hands. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let's enter the world of enforcement and uh, talk about Lifeline and Link of as the main topic today. 
Uh, in the Enforcement Bureau, of course, we are charged with uh, promoting competition, but at the same time maintaining compliance with the Telecommunications Act. I have a slide here that also generally shows the Enforcement Bureau's organizational chart, uh, displaying our divisions and regional offices, things of that nature. I am located in the Telecommunications Consumers Division of the Enforcement Bureau, dealing primarily with consumer issues, uh, uh, protecting consumers from fraudulent, misleading, and other activities uh, that involve telecommunications. In the Enforcement Bureau, there are two types of actions that we, that, or I'm sorry, in the Telecommunications Consumers Division, there are two types of actions that we generally take, uh, one being formal complaints and the other being investigations. And for purposes of our discussion today, we're going to focus on investigations. Many topics are of, of interest that are currently in the in TCD, I'm going to go ahead and say TCD, which will represent Telecommunications Consumer Division, include lifeline link-up, prepaid calling cards, truth and billing, slamming, and cramming. Now, I want to give you a little background on our investigations as we look at uh, these areas, these topic areas. Um, pattern of practice, when we're investigating, we may first look at a pattern of practice. What does that mean? Uh, informal complaints are filed with the commission on a regular basis, and we might begin to look at a company and say, hmm, uh, a lot of consumers appear to be filing complaints on this particular issue. Perhaps there's something to this. Perhaps there's a pattern of practice uh, that might, there might be an alleged violation we might need to investigate on that. Pattern of practice, that's one area. SNAP and NARUT calls. Uh, SNAP, I believe, standing for State National Access Plan. These are state groups that meet quarterly or monthly. They meet quite often. We participate in these, um, in these uh, conference calls. Here we find out information from the states as to what's going on nationwide, and that's very important because oftentimes a consumer may file a complaint at the state level, but not necessarily at the federal level. And actually, uh, we get a more global view or nationwide view of, of activity from state to state uh, that we may not see readily at the Federal Communications Commission. So the SNAP and NARUT calls are very important to us. Another form of investigation technique that we will use is uh, informant. An informant, uh, sometimes someone may come to the commission because they're a little uh, unsure of the practices that are happening within their company and they don't feel comfortable about it, so they may confidentially come to us and provide us with information that may be a red flag for us to, to launch an investigation. So informants are very important, and as you'll see later on in the lifeline link-up context, a different type of informant was one that when the tribal leaders came to the commission because they were, uh, they were not quite sure of the uh, telecommunications access or the telephone access for Native Americans living on tribal lands um, in relationship to the lifeline link-up program. So informants can take on many different um, aspects. As well, we as attorneys will look at Westlaw and Lexis. And when we're looking at Westlaw and Lexis, we're looking at what has the commission done in the past? Where, where, where were they on this subject several years ago? Where are they today on this subject? As we begin to look in terms of investigating a particular violation or alleged violation of our rules. So that's very important to us. Um, Finally, I want to add in here, because uh, it will be very important to Lifeline and LinkUp in particular, is penetration rates. Sometimes it might be necessary for us to look at penetration rates, telephone penetration rates nationwide. How many people are receiving telephone service in different communities, low-income communities, tribal communities? The uh, Wireline Tom Competition uh, Bureau website provides a lot of that statistical information for us. And I would encourage people to, to uh, take advantage of the, that. It is public information out there for you. Now, I want to note here that all of these investigations, pattern of practice, state calls, informant, penetration rates, those are internal processes that are going on. This is not public. This is, this is us internally figuring out whether or not there is a violation of our rules. So the bottom line is the public does not know this is going on. But um, still, we are always, always wanting to hear what is going on in the states to, to formulate our investigations. 
So let's say we have a lot of uh, information before us. The next thing we'll do is we'll send out a letter of inquiry to the company to def- try and find out uh, if something is going on. We'll say, you know, we, we, there may be an alleged violation of a particular rule. And we have these questions that we need you to answer under penalty of perjury. And the company will be directed to respond within a certain amount of time. Again, this is still confidential in nature. It's not a public document. It's a conversation that is going on between the carrier and uh, the FCC. And based on that, uh, we go to the next slide, and it talks about orders that can come resulting from our investigations. Notice of apparent liability, order of forfeiture, order and consent decree, as well as an order of admonishment, all relevant here when we're going to speak about Lifeline and Link up here in a moment. Uh, I'll just go over it a little bit for the non-attorneys that may be in the crowd, but we won't spend too much time on it. Notice of apparent liability. That's where one would say, you know, the commission is saying, uh, Company X, we're putting you on notice that there may be an alleged violation of our rules. Here's what we have factually found. And based on what we have factually found under Section 1503 of the Act, we are imposing, we may impose a fine of a given amount you're directed to respond within 60 days. And Company X responds. And what, based on what Company X responds, several things could happen. They may present, as we say, mitigating factors that may eliminate the notice of apparent liability. Or they may present factors that may get rid of a few things, but not everything. Um, or they may present something that doesn't even work at all. Um, In any event, let's say that there may be some mitigating factors, but it does not dismiss the forfeiture, uh, the the, uh, notice of apparent liability. Based on that, we go to an order of forfeiture, and in that order of forfeiture, we lay out the facts, the violation of the rule, and the fine amount that is to be paid to to forfeited to the U.S. Treasury based on that action that that company has, the, the, the rule that that company has violated the order of forfeiture will file a notice of apparent liability. Another form of of an order that we can issue is the order and consent decree. And this is really, um, in its own way, has a lot of positive uh, effects. Remember when I mentioned that we send a letter of inquiry to the company? Well, the company then is aware that, hmm, you know, okay, I I see where they're coming from. You know, there's no... I'm not admitting liability, I'm not denying liability, but I would like to talk about some, uh, some issues that may be going on in, in respect to that particular rule. And maybe there are some things that I as a company can, be, can do as, as a settlement technique to um, make this investigation, terminate this investigation. And as well, this might be a point at which I may voluntarily pay a fund to the U.S. Treasury. What is good about that is it, puts, it helps the company to go ahead and take a proactive approach or an or approach to rectifying a problem, help working on it. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a plus behind the order and consent decree. Order of admonishment, another form that we use, is, is short of an order of forfeiture. And in order of admonishment, what we're saying here is that Company X, we see that there are some issues here. Um, we are not at the point at which we will impose a fine or an order of forfeiture against you, but we are putting you essentially on notice that these are concerns to us with respect to this particular rule, the actions that are taking place, and we need you to do something about that, or we encourage you to do something about that, and we will be watching to see in the future um, how that particular issue is resolved. So those are the types of, of, of orders that we work with um, in, in our investigation. Let's now move to the world of Lifeline and LinkUp. As it was already mentioned, Lifeline and LinkUp is a universal support mechanism that allows low-income individuals to, uh, to receive their telephone service at a reduced rate. Lifeline being the basic local service itself, Link up essentially being the mechanisms to, or the, the, uh, the um, equipment that might be necessary to hook up the service. So if you live in a remote area, you may need some type of cable from the company to, able, to be able to even obtain telephone service. So link up is literally that. It's linking you up 
to the uh, telephone service. What is interesting here, and I have put it out there, is there are a series of orders, and I hope I'm am I on track here. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are a series of orders that I myself found very important um, to take a look at. The 1997 order you'll see here is an order that really puts the mechanism in place, makes it explicit that we are going to here look at the Telecommunications Act, Section 254, and we want to make sure that rates are affordable and access is provided to low-income individuals um, in in terms of lifeline and link-up support and also in terms of other uh, universal service support mechanisms. Again, we're concentrating on lifeline and link-up. But we want to make sure that that this is being provided. In the 1997 order, it really solidified a relationship between state and federal. Um, USAC, the Universal Service Administration Company, uh, administers the fund. All of these mechanisms were put in place. And as well, you would also see um, some federal default programs that if you were involved in the federal universal service uh, or, I'm sorry, the Federal Lifeline Link-Up Program, um, and were a part of Medicaid SSI, you were automatically um, able to receive Lifeline and Link-Up. When we go to the 2000 order, uh, that even is, is, that brings into play what I mentioned earlier about the notion of penetration rates. In the 2000 order, the commission saw that nationwide, 94% of people were receiving uh, uh, telephone service. The penetration rate was at 94%. But for Native Americans on tribal lands, it was only 47%, and that was very alarming. So enhanced mechanisms were put in place for individuals living on tribal lands. And uh, some of these enhancements were, were uh, programs, programs, additional programs that were really were catered more to the uh, Native American community. And as well, uh, um, the, the, the uh, amount to receive Lifeline and Link Up was, was increased. So the amount to the, to, of, of support to the consumer. So the consumer uh, would not have to pay as much um, in terms of receiving Lifeline and Link Up. What is also very interesting in this order is that the commission said, you know, we need to start looking at the requirement that these carriers, um, who re- who, these carriers that are providing Lifeline and Link Up advertise in a manner reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify for the service. That became very important in this order. We didn't establish any type of guidelines or requirements, but we did say, you know, be aware of the demographics of your area. Reach out to your community. Look at the culture. Look at the linguistics and see what you can do in order to to further advance Lifeline and Link Up. The, only other, the other order I want to mention, because I think it's important for, for those who are trying to understand this concept, is the Lifeline Link Up order that came out in 2004. And in that order, it opened back up, back up to looking at low-income individuals in general as well. And what's exciting here is it added more federal default programs. Not only did you see things like Medicaid and SSI and food stamps, but you also saw uh, temporary assistance to needy families. So individuals who participate in these programs are eligible to receive Lifeline and Link Up. What's great in this order, too, is they provide, they also added an income-based criteria. And if you're at 130, 135% at or below the poverty level, you're also eligible to receive Lifeline and Link Up. Finally, I think what's important to point out in this particular order are the guidelines. We've never put in requirements to date in terms of how you need to advertise for Lifeline and Link Up, but we have established now guidelines. And that some of those guidelines include looking out for those who do not receive the service. Um, so what would you do in that, in that sense? Oh, put it out on the radio, media, use the radio, use the TV, use posters in designated or what you think are, are excellent locations, advertisements on buses in, in particular communities, um, advertisements or posters in community centers. Um, we also said uh, if, be aware of those who speak different languages. Provide the brochures, provide the information in other languages so that people can learn about the program. 
Also provide in other formats for those with disabilities because there will be people who may need those types of formats. Finally, also look at the federal default programs. Look at the public assistance programs. Provide brochures in those arenas so people are aware that the program exists and we can improve the penetration rate for low-income individuals. I have also added here for those who really want to dive into it and do, to get more information, the USAC website um, that has all of the orders listed and really provides an excellent background on low income and lifeline and link up. So I encourage you uh, to, to um, take a look at the website. It's very user friendly. Okay, so let's turn very quickly to the rules that the Enforcement Bureau is excited about in terms of enforcing lifeline and link up. Uh, so rule, it's one of them is section 214. We also have 54.405 and 54.411. All of them are basically saying that a carrier who is providing uh, lifeline and link up support must advertise in a manner reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify for the service. In a manner reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify for the service. Now, those of us who are attorneys uh, all, all of a sudden go, uh-oh, not that reasonable word and not that likely word. Well, what we're saying here is that, again, we're not going to tell you exactly how to, you know, who is in your service area when you got your ETC status, when you became an eligible telecommunications carrier and were put on board to provide Lifeline and link up, we are assuming that you know your service area. So we want to leave it to you to try and advertise in a manner reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify for the service. Um, but if that doesn't happen, and in this instance when I, when I was talking about informants, well, something did happen. Um, in this area. Tribal leaders came to the commission, uh, and I'd say it was in 2002, 2003, and they said, it's not happening. Um, we have the penetration rate, the telephone penetration rate in our area is still low, and our people are not learning about these services, and these services are very important to get that basic local, local service for employment purposes, for emergency purposes. So what we did is we launched an investigation. We looked at the penetration rates. We, took, we looked at the companies that tribal leaders suggested. And uh, out of the fray, you'll see that companies emerge. Pindare Telephone Company, Verizon Communications, Quest Communications, and CenturyTel. Um, very quickly, um, um, Pindare was the first um, of the bunch. And in Pindare, it was excuse me, it's a very small telecommunications company and it serves one reservation in the state of Washington. And when we looked at Pendore Telephone Company, um, and this really gets back to when we're saying reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify for the service, we saw that this company advertised Lifeline and LinkUp in its newspapers, um, in applications uh, to, to uh, consumers, and also in um, telephone directories. Well, let's take a look at those real quick. Uh, sure, uh, telephone, av or, I'm sorry, uh, newspaper advertisements are very important, but when we looked at this particular company, it was not in plain language. You couldn't really locate what was for what, and we weren't sure what, if, if it, uh, someone looking at it would not be able to decipher it and know that, oh, Lifeline and LinkUp, I can, I can apply for that. I can get this affordable service. So we did not think it was really geared towards a consumer um, um, getting that information. It wasn't reasonably designed to reach those likely to qualify. The same with applications. Now, the, the concept was good, and the company failed to present uh, information that would really support that this type of information was placed in there specifically about Lifeline and LinkUp. So again, we concluded that it, it did not meet um, our, our standard under our rules. Finally, under the, tele, the telephone books, they said they uh, advertised in telephone books. Well, again, the company failed to present evidence showing 
uh, these advertisements, but more importantly, we weren't really convinced that advertising in a telephone book is the best means because logically telephone books go to people who already have service. So um, as you see, and, 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 and let me point out that these cases are the first in the set of cases with respect to this advertising rule. So as you see, we're also feeling our way as we're looking at a case-by-case -case basis um, with respect to these companies. Pindle Ray did manage, Pindle Ray did, did uh, provide a mitigating factor that they are in good standing with the commission overall, and we took that into consideration. And reduce, we did do an order of forfeiture, but we reduced their fine from 25000 to 20000 Let's move on to Verizon Communications. Verizon Communications, we issued an order of admonishment against the company. And in Verizon Communications, again, we looked at the... Uh, the large number of tribes that, that they cover. And what was interesting here is that there were 11 tribes that a time had elapsed. We're de dealing with a time, time frame here. Two and a half to three years had elapsed between advertising. And, you know, we, we, we determined that too much activity occurs in one's, one's life for two to three and a half years, or I'm sorry, two and a half to three years to, to elapse. So we said to the company that that really is too much, that is not reasonable. Um, it doesn't rise to the level of issuing a forfeiture, but we're putting you on notice that that really is not a reasonable conduct because people's lives change, they move on and off reservations, so much is going on that advertising uh, needs to be, take place a little more frequently. And further, what was interesting about that case is that going back to our LOI, um, our, lo our letter of inquiry, when we issued the letter of inquiry to Verizon, miraculously after that, these particular companies res or reservations received advertisement. And our thought from there was, uh, while we, we applaud the action, we are hoping that the company will take a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach to advertising Lifeline and LinkUp. Um, Quest Communications and uh, CenturyTel are that wonderful example of order and consent decrees. And um, the, again, stemming from the LOI issued to the company, Letter of Inquiry, they came in and they spoke to us. And again, settlement took place. And they both put in uh, mechanisms that they would undertake, powwows, going to powwows, establishing a very good relationship with tribal leaders, trying to disseminate information, trying to learn about the people and the communities that are in their service area. So it, it, in that sense, it, it worked out very well. well. Um, Quest Communications gave a voluntary contribution to the tre of treasury of 250000 and century tell 75,000 but I think to take away here is that the order and consent decree the company you know put in place mechanisms to ensure that they are advertising in accordance with our rules so uh, that was a good win-win situation to take away from this uh, even though tribal uh, the tribal community was the first community that we've dealt with so far um, we are we are always looking at Lifeline and LinkUp in general to low-income uh, consumers. Here you'll see that the, uh, the telephone, the means of telephone is wireline, but we're also looking at the wireless context. So we're always wanting to know what is going on out there in terms of this area, uh, Lifeline and LinkUp. Finally, on this last slide, I think it's very important, even though it's from a policy perspective, it will greatly affect how we in the Enforcement Bureau uh, deal with Lifeline and LinkUp. On May 4th, uh, this month, 2010, the Commission uh, requested that the, for the state, federal state joint board to review the Lifeline and LinkUp eligibility outreach and all of the aspects of that particular program, the rules that are in place. Do we need to make, make uh, more requirements rather than guidelines? We need to now take into effect that the terrain, uh, we're in wireless, we're we're in wireline. There's so many other ways that we communicate. And also to take into uh, consideration the national broadband plan as it affects low-income 
consumers receiving Lifeline and LinkUp. So there's a review going on right now, and I encourage people to follow all of this because it is very important, and it will, in the end, directly affect how we enforce Lifeline and LinkUp. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer or direct you to someone who can. <laughs> anybody, anybody from our NAG calls or SNAP, uh, the calls that Cynthia mentioned uh, earlier on in her presentation? Or anybody uh, online? Oh, okay. I think Carmen says, oh, oh. We have uh, something from Peter Saar from the Maryland Office of People's Council. Peter says, a number of companies have applied in Maryland to provide lifeline and link-up service to low-income households in the state. Have there been any issues that have de been detected regarding the services provided from telecom companies that pay for the wireless phones for low-income households <coughs> through USF funds on which regulators should be focusing? So um, have there been any uh, issues to detected uh, on uh, the wireless um, side? Well, again, I would have to say um, Thanks, that... Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I would have to say that, as I mentioned earlier, we are always interested and always looking into a myriad of issues um, to, you know, specifically say whether... In, I cannot specifically say whether or not we are investigating a particular matter or not. But I will say that, that all of those types of issues are on our radar. Um, that is about the best that I can say with that. I'm always interested if, Peter, you have information that you want to provide, um, any red flags that you see, we're always ready to receive that information. And I encourage anyone to email me, Cynthia.Bryant at FCC.gov, um, and uh, we, can, we can look into that. But I am kind of limited in terms of any specifics in that area, but I can tell you that we are looking at and continue to look at uh, wireless and wireline um, issues with respect to Lifeline and LinkUp. Thanks, Cynthia. That was uh, great, and obviously can't, if there's an ongoing investigation, can't uh, no. <laughs> discuss it. So sorry, Peter, for the uh, vagueness, but um, uh, like Cynthia said, please give her a call or contact us, and we'll certainly put you um, in contact with the Enforcement Bureau or uh, anybody else out there. Um, if, we don't have any, if we don't have any other questions, I think we can move on. And thank you so much, uh, Cynthia, for your time. That thank was you. That was excellent. Uh, we appreciate it. Sure. Okay. Our next speaker is, uh, actually our next two presentations come to us from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. First up is Karen Johnson, a senior attorney in the Policy Division, and she's going to be talking about bill shock. Um, and this has been a big issue for us uh, lately. The uh, Commission's been doing some releases on it, and I will, uh, and Karen will be up to discuss it. And it's the issue of looking at your bill and saying, Oh my God, how did that happen? <laughs> so we'll let Karen talk about all this. And I think uh, anybody with uh, kids and uh, their cell phones certainly have had bill shock at one point or another. Emmett, is that presentation up? Great. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining Thanks us here all. today. And um, as you see here, we have um, a PowerPoint here with um, Bill Shot. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you all. As you can see, our client here is exasperated. Um, the um, Bill Shock is the unwelcome surprise that some consumers experience when their monthly wireless bill is larger than expected. On May 11, 2010, the Federal Communications Commission released a public notice asking whether it should adopt usage control measures that will help consumers avoid receiving higher than expected bills from their wireless communication services. Today, actually, there was a release uh, to update this to provide the actual comment dates. The comment date due date is July 6, 2010, and the reply comment date is July 19, 2010. You'll find that uh, on our page of the Daily Digest. 
I'm getting updated here. Okay, so now they have the update here. Yes, there's your definition of bill shot. We just discussed the public notice. Specific questions raised in the public notice. Do technological or other differences exist that would prevent wireless providers in this country from adopting similar usage controls now required by the European Union? What are these measures that the European Union has adopted? Default notifications regarding wireless services. Free text detailing roaming prices for sending and receiving voice data and text messages. Another helpful tool is notice to customers when data usage is approaching the preset limits. When also when data usage limits, limits are reached, carriers stop service until the customer contacts the provider. Another question raised, to what extent do consumers currently have the means at their disposal to monitor on a real-time basis their wireless usage and the means to be aware of the consequences of exceeding their predetermined allocations of voice minutes, text messages, or data usage? We also ask to what extent are U.S. providers already offering such monitoring and notification features and at what cost to the consumer? or the provider. Do U.S. wireless providers offer accommodations to persons with hearing, visual, cognitive, or other disabilities to ensure access to monitoring and notification information? Those specific questions were raised in the public notice, and we certainly hope to hear from our state and local uh, counterparts to illuminate the issues further. They, here are some tips for avoiding bill shock now, the mobile minutes made simple. Understand your calling patterns for voice calls and ask your provider for a plan that best suits your needs. If you're an infrequent user, consider a prepaid plan. Also understand what your roaming charges are and where you will incur them. Another tip, please understand your options for data and text plans, as these are often sources for overcharge, overage charges. If you expect to take your phone outside of the United States and potentially use it for voice or data, including email, ask your provider what charges may apply before you leave. We've had a couple of feedback instances on our um, blog detailing how persons have uh, accessed their email accounts uh, while in the U.S and didn't close their browser out and unwittingly uh, began to incur uh, data roaming charges uh, as they proceeded on their international trips. So that definitely involves some bill shock upon the consumer's return and receipt of the bill. Things you may want to ask your wireless provider. How many peak and non-peak minutes are included in your plan? What are the peak and non-peak hours? As you know, these vary these hours vary per wireless carrier. Some start at 9 p.m., some start at 7, as early as 7, so that's very important to determine. Also, does a wireless provider charge more for roaming service, and if so, how much? Does a wireless provider offer notice when a call generates a roaming charge? Is there any type of feature or feedback that you get as the consumer when placing a call or um, dialing a, a particular number. Oh, pardon me. Next, you, uh, another thing to consider is whether text messages are included in your plan. If they are not included, how much will you be charged to receive and send each text? If you do have text messages included in your plan, will your service provider notify you when the text messaging limit is approaching? Lastly, can you or the wireless provider block test text messaging? I know this feature is allowed on, on some providers. Uh, it's incumbent upon the consumer at this point to investigate that further and do the calls and outreach to, to the provider to determine how to um, invoke these options. Lastly, um, there are a series of things that may also be helpful. Is your wireless phone web enabled? If you have a web enabled phone, are you charged even if you don't use the web? 
Another thing you may want to be aware of uh, is that the, depending on the type of font or face or activation switch or button that you may have, you may accidentally uh, trigger or launch your web service. Do you have a data allowance uh, in your plan? Is a critical piece of information. Also, how much is the charge to access the web? Can the wireless provider notify you if you are approaching your data limit? Also, can you or the wireless provider block web access? Those are questions that we thought important and we thought would be helpful for the consumers to consider and, and propose to their wireless carriers. Again, our comment date is July 6, 2010. Our reply comment date is July 19, 2010. Um, there are some other background material and um, the tips that, that I, some of the tips that I went through have been posted in addition to others on our website. You, you can also find, of course, the public notice and mobile minutes made simple. At yeah. this point, I'll turn back to Greg and see if we have yeah. any concerns. That been no, no, I was, I was going to point everybody to the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau web page of the um, FCC, and then if you click under news, you can see both the public notice for Bill Shock as well as the um, uh, press release on it. And, uh, you know, the press release is a really good it's a quick summary of what Karen was speaking about, but, um, you know, in the, in the EU, as you start to run out of minutes or you get close uh, to the your allotted amount of text or data, you guess you get some sort of notification um, that, that could, uh, you know, you might heed before you run over and, and run into um, bill shock, for lack of a better term. So uh, those are the things that are teed up, and again, the public, no the um, press release and uh, the public notice itself or the, uh, are on our web page. Mm -hmm. yes. Anybody? We have a lot of consumer advocates on the line. Uh, so if, uh, anybody uh, via email or uh, dialing in? I know it's getting late in the afternoon, but um, uh, I'm wondering maybe some of these complaints are going to the states instead of us or vice versa. Right. Uh, can anybody chime in on that? Okay. All right. Well, then we're going to uh, um, move on to our last presentation of the day. Uh, we have uh, Colleen Heitkamp, a new um, uh, chief in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Colleen was formerly a chief in the Enforcement Bureau, and I know uh, a lot of our um, friends at the Attorney General's offices and the um, Consumer Advocates probably know Colleen from her uh, former role in the Enforcement Bureau. And Colleen's going to speak to us today about cramming. Um, and that's, uh, and um, I think you guys are familiar with that issue, but Colleen will give us an uh, update. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm going to give you just a, a very brief update. This is um, um, an area that has been of interest for at least the last 10 years, and I worked in this area uh, on the enforcement side and then um, now in the policy area. So cramming uh, as defined is, uh, cramming refers to the inclusion on, of unauthorized charges on a consumer's phone bill. And those unauthorized charges can originate either from the uh, consumer's own telephone company or from a third party vendor. Okay. The impact on consumers is ongoing and significant. Um, both the FCC and the FTC receive complaints in this arena. I'm sure many states do as well, uh, both in their Attorney General's office and then probably in their public service uh, commissions. And each one of these complaints can represent potentially hundreds of thousands of consumers who may not recognize that they um, have been crammed for similar charges. So uh, we, ha we continue to get a high volume of complaints in this area, and each complaint represents a multitude of consumers. Um, and then in terms of remedies, those who file complaints uh, with their telephone company or a state or federal regulator may be refunded for those unauthorized charges. But at the same time, there's many others 
who uh, don't detect those charges and are unlikely to be reimbursed. And some of these charges go on for a significant period of time before a consumer um, recognizes that they've been uh, um, charged for an un an unauthorized service. In uh, 1998, um, at the FCC's uh, direction, uh, the industry itself came up with a code of best practices. Um, I'll just skim through these, uh, but the company best practices were that bills should be comprehensible, consumers should be provided with a, a blocking mechanism, um, consumers, uh, their authorization of services could be verified, Lex, our local exchange company, should uh, screen products and services that any third party uh, provider wanted to include on a phone bill. Um, the clearing houses that aggregate billing for third party consumers should submit that uh, billing and, and submit that billing to the local exchange companies for inclusion in bills, should ensure that only authorized charges are included. Uh, the local exchange company should continue to educate consumers as to their rights and, and the process for resolving disputes. And um, each of the local exchange carriers sh should provide appropriate law enforcement, regulatory agencies, and other uh, local exchange carriers with data to insist them in controlling cramming. Now, these were voluntary practices that the industry came up with, so not every carrier um, was compelled to follow each one of these guidelines, but they could pick and choose uh, amongst the guidelines with these, these, so these were best practices that the companies came up with um, in, in lieu of us coming up with rules. Well then just a year later in um, 1999, um, the FCC promulgated rules uh, that require customer bills to be clearly organized and clearly identify the service provider, highlight any new providers, um, contain full and non-misleading descriptions of charges that appear therein, and contain clear and conspicuous disclosure of any information the consumer may need to make inquiries about or contest charges on the bill. So every phone bill um, that consumers receive today should follow these, these uh, three guidelines or principles. But that considerable amount of time ago, so uh, now we fast forward to just last fall, 10 years later, and uh, the commission um, issued a notice of inquiry asking whether these rules uh, should be updated or changed in any way, whether their uh, impact um, should be broadened to other entities besides just um, uh, telephone um, service providers. And um, that um, comments were filed uh, uh, in response to that notice of inquiry. And I'm just going to summarize um, the groups of comments. We had um, government and consumer groups and they're generally, generally, their comments could be summarized to uh, ask that we require the billing carriers uh, the option to block third-party billing. And so they were proposing that that was a rule that we would put in place. Um, secondly, they uh, asked us to require uh, common carriers to undertake due diligence measures in terms of screening third-party service providers before permitting them to place charges on the bill. Uh, they ask that we enhance cooperation among law enforcement entities, uh, including sharing complaints with state and federal uh, regulators. Um, they also thought it was necessary that we clarify that cramming could include not only unauthorized charges on a local exchange company's bill, but also unauthorized charges that appear on other bills. And I think primary among those other entities are uh, wireless companies. Believe that that's a, a, a new area of concern, or not that new, but certainly an area of concern we've not addressed. And uh, finally, they wanted to ensure that third party billers themselves be identified and provide contact information on, on the telephone bill. 
not too surprisingly, uh, the industry comments um, can be summarized as saying that carriers uh, are sufficiently motivated to protect their own subscribers and no new rules are needed. And these uh, sufficient safeguards that are in place uh, include uh, just their own compliance with state and federal laws, corrective measures taken against, and that they take um, corrective measures against problem billers. They do do pre-screening and monitoring. They do offer, some companies offer blocking options, and they also point to the fact that they um, re rapidly resolve complaints. So that brings us to um, up, up to date now. Uh, we're not certain uh, what we'll do with these comments, but the possible next steps would be for the Commission to issue an, uh, an NPRM or a notice of proposed rule, rulemaking to propose any necessary rules that we think need to be uh, put in place to uh, more effectively protect consumers. Uh, should that occur, there will be a comment and reply comment period, and at that time we'll uh, be soliciting comments, and we certainly want to hear comments from consumer groups and uh, in state and local governments who feel like these issues are problems for their constituents, um, and you'll be notified of that with a public notice in terms of that comment and reply comment period. Um, again, um, I don't know for certain that that's what the Commission will do, but that brings you up to date in terms of where we are with this issue and what our next steps may be. And that's, that's what I have for today. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Colleen. Um, uh, if, there aren't any, if there aren't any questions or comments, uh, either via the phone or the email, I think we're going to wrap up our uh, first state and local webinar. It's been a long afternoon. Um, Thank you for everybody for participating, and I think uh, this was the first of its kind at the Commission where our entire audience was remote, and I think it was a success, and we've gotten a lot of emails in, and um, we look forward to your feedback uh, so we can see how to improve this for next time. So thanks, everybody, and have a nice afternoon.